So by way of introduction, you'll recall that uh, at the last city council a study session on the budget, you received a report related to the forecast that had been prepared by management partners. Um, and we had uh, anticipated coming to you on September 22nd with uh, uh, budget actions. Uh, we uh, asked that uh, that be uh, uh, deferred to today in order to allow our finance director and our finance department to uh, collect some additional data. They were in the process of reconciliating the, uh, the uh, uh, fiscal year uh, 2021 uh, budget uh, numbers. In other words, uh, doing the last year's closeout and getting more accurate uh, data as far as how we ended the last fiscal year in terms of our revenues and in terms of our expenditures. And felt that uh, having that additional data would uh, provide uh, uh, more information that we could uh, include into our model and our forecast and, and give us a better sense of what we needed to do. And so I'll just kind of briefly, <clears throat> excuse me, give you an overview of what we found. Uh, in essence, the, the overall fiscal situation really has not changed uh, in general, meaning that uh, we still are uh, have a structural budget deficit before us, and that's what we're facing. We're facing a structural budget deficit, meaning that we anticipate uh, uh, deficits over multiple years, uh, and so that puts us in a position to have to take uh, reductions uh, in order to, uh, for expenditures to meet the revenues over multiple years. However, there is some, some bit of good news in that uh, the uh, we did end the year uh, in, in, in a better cash position, so we didn't draw down our fund balance as much as uh, we uh, had anticipated. So that does give us a little bit more flexibility. Uh, and the main thing is that uh, looking ahead, it does allow us to reduce our second year cut. So we still have to do a $10 million set of cuts over t two years as opposed to a $12 million set of cuts. So if we do $6 million this year, then the following year, in fiscal year 2022, that'll be closer to 4 million, the 3.75 million that's, uh, that's listed here. So um, again, it doesn't necessarily change our basic uh, fiscal, overall fiscal situation. We're still uh, in a position where we have to uh, make uh, structural reductions so that we don't draw down our fund balances uh, to an unacceptable level. I think the main thing is that uh, whereas before we were, we were facing a position where we we're gonna draw down our fund balance to a very, very low unacceptable level, that really put us uh, uh, in a perilous position, particularly if anything else happened, we had any kind of disaster with respect to storms or anything else that happened. Uh, now this allows us to have uh, reserves that are still below what they need to be, but uh, a little a little better off uh, at a 10% level as opposed to uh, uh, lower than that and, and uh, certainly not the 17% level that we need to have. So that's kind of an overview of really what's happened. Uh, and uh, now I'll turn it over to our finance director who will go through the details of uh, the forecast and, and uh, the recommendations before you. Uh, thank you, city manager. I have a confession to make. I did something on my computer and I lost the ability to turn my screen on. So I apologize, this is my first time um, doing a presentation and I'm on my home computer, so. There we go, thank you. How's that? Yes, that's working. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, so far today, um, we've adopted the status quo working budget on July 2nd, uh, 2020. And that was basically a copy of the uh, 1920 ad adopted budget or revised budget. We also hired management partners to prepare the COVID and recessionary forecast. They're a well-known firm made up of uh, former finance directors and city managers. So they have a lot of experience in this field. They've worked with a lot of cities. Uh, so we were happy to work with them and uh, they have a forecast that they've built and they can use for multiple cities and they put in our data and um, use, use our data to make the analysis. And council implemented um, some budget saving measures already for fiscal year 2021. Uh, we implemented a hiring freeze. 
We also implemented a 10% reduction in personnel costs. So this was either a furlough or layoffs in the police department or some frozen positions in the fire department. This resulted in a 4.5 million in estimated savings. If you'll notice, that is a little bit less than what was presented before, uh, which was 5.7 million. Uh, that's uh, we, the number, the 4.5 million number comes from the actual personnel estimates we have now in this revised budget. So it excludes the early retirement positions and um, the positions that are proposed for elimination. So the, the estimated savings went down. Uh, we also have the early retirement incentive that was offered. 26 employees took advantage of that, resulting in 1.4 million in savings. Uh, the estimate that was presented previously was 1.8 million. So this also went down a little bit because we uh, netted it out with the cash outs that were for these longtime employees. So the savings was just a little bit less. We implemented a voluntary time off policy. We also deferred general fund supported CIP projects. And we've identified as much as we can for FEMA reimbursements and federal and state aid. And we established a council budget committee and we've been meeting with them. This is a list of the 26 positions that uh, retired early by department. And um, as you can see, the public works number is uh, quite a bit higher than everyone else, but they also have the largest number of full-time equivalents. So as a percentage, it's not any higher than any other department. Uh, the management partners forecast was presented to the council on August 18th, 2020. Uh, it included a COVID impact, a recessionary impact, and the existing structural deficit. They recommended 12 million in solutions over two years. And these solutions could be comprised of enhanced revenues, service delivery changes, expenditure controls or cost shifts, and service level reductions. And we have a little bit of each of those in the uh, proposal tonight. This is a, a graph of their presentation. So the, they recommended, it came out with like 11 to 14 million in solutions. If you look at the best case and then the worst case. So we went with the baseline case in the middle and which was the 12 million in solutions. The dotted blue line is the city's reserve goal which is about 17% of expenditures. That is also the Government Finance Officers Association, their recommended reserve goal. The red line is the city's actual projected fund balance um, or cash position. And as you can see, it drops pretty low. And that's why we're bringing this to you tonight so we can bring that up uh, to an acceptable level. We definitely don't wanna fall below 10 million. That's only about 10% of our general fund expenditures. So the, we also took some other measures to try to get that reserve or cash balance up. And uh, most of these are in the proposal that was that is presented tonight. We adjusted the reserve funds when we could. The, the balance in the workers' comp fund was considerably higher than we need to meet current claims. So we recommended um, pulling out 3.5 million from that fund and 1.9 million of that goes to the general fund and the other 1.6 million goes to the enterprise funds. We eliminated the fiscal year 2020 transfer of TOT to the ED trust fund. That brought back 1.1 million to the general fund. It also leaves them enough to do their projects. And then we reduced the fiscal year 2021 TOT transfer to the ED trust fund by half. And because the TOT had trans, uh, reduced significantly in 2020, that resulted in a $400,000 savings to the general fund when it's normally uh, quite a bit more. We also reduced the workers' comp rates by 25%. And then we uh, asked the, each department to cut a total of 6 million in the fiscal 21, 2021 um, budget, targeting sustainability. So we asked that the cuts be permanent and not one time in nature is that's what we really need to do to bring up that red line that we looked at earlier. We set a reduction target for each department. 
Um, at a minimum, we asked for 6%, and for some departments, we gave, more, uh, we gave a little bit higher target than that. We also asked them to eliminate vacant positions when possible and to evaluate their professional services to see if they needed to uh, carry those balances. The revenue forecast that's in tonight's proposal is based on the fiscal year 2020 actuals. We do need to monitor it closely as it may be optimistic. Um, as you know, being a tourist town, July and August are our largest months for revenue, so we've already missed those. So we just wanna make sure we carefully monitor that and we may recommend adjustments at mid-year. Uh, the council budget committee met uh, three times and it was broken into two different rounds. Uh, management partners presented their model um, for review and comment from the council. Uh, so we had the two rounds of meetings and then we had a, a third round earlier this week to bring this final recommendation to you. So our target was $6 million in, in some kind of solution. Uh, we, we found just over 13,000 in ongoing revenue. That's a new source from the state. It's a part of a fee that we're going to collect. Uh, on this time frame, it's harder to find any more new revenues. We need a little bit longer look to do that. So we did focus on the expenditure side. In the service level reduction or elimination category, we found over 2.1 million in savings. In the service delivery alternative or cost shift, we found 1.75 million in savings. And in one-time reductions, we found 1.4 million. So the proposed total of reductions is 5,334,000. The shortfall is 665,000. However, we make up 400,000 of that with the, the stopping the transfer from TOT to the ED trust fund. So in the finance department, the target was 189,000. We eliminated two vacant positions. Uh, one is an accountant in audits. One is a management analyst in risk, which is only half funded by the general fund. We're also recommending that we reclassify one vacant position um, from an accounting assistant two to an administrative assistant three, as we don't have an administrative person in the department. And then we found um, 72,000 and other reductions for the office lease in the NIAC building, software travel and office furniture for total reductions of almost 270,000. The information technology budget, uh, their target was 219,000. They have several vacancies in their department, so we didn't recommend eliminating any personnel at this time, but we will evaluate it at mid-year. Uh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry, I, if I may interrupt just really briefly, just for the council. Uh, these slides are, summarize the, the, the proposed reductions, but in your packet is a spreadsheet that details these numbers, which you may want to reference uh, when you begin your deliberations. I just wanted to highlight that for the council. Thank you. Thank you, Martine. Uh, so IT did um, propose extending computer replacements. That saves about 100,000 for the general fund. Uh, human resources, uh, they have a very small budget. They did recommend eliminating one vacant administrative position that's funded half by the general fund. And then they have some other miscellaneous service um, reductions. The city manager's office uh, has uh, mostly service reductions, and it's broken down kind of by category in the department. City attorney, um, just about 50,000. City council, 32,000. City clerk, 28,000. Um, the city manager division, 51,000. The animal shelter, JPA, 77,000. And the community programs, 152,000. The council budget committee did want to um, want us to tell you that they had a concern in that area. So I think it'll be for further discussion tonight. And Martine and Laura, if, if you would like to speak on any of those, please feel free. Uh, yeah, I just add that uh, yeah, this, this category includes uh, a number of divisions as uh, uh, Kim point, pointed out. And uh, the breakdown of the community programs is in your, uh, that's that, the table that's uh, attached to your packet as well. 
And then it's offset by an addition that council requested earlier in the year when we implemented the employee furlough program and it's for economic hardship for employees. So the net reductions are 360,000. Oh, I should add, I'm sorry. One other thing, and that is the, uh, the I believe there's a request also to fund the, uh, the UCSC advocate uh, position as well. So that would have to be added to the, the budget as well. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Uh, in the Public Works Department, uh, they're recommending eliminating one vacant assistant engineer two position in engineering. And they also had some other various reductions in services and supplies in street maintenance, parking services division, and uh, they're also recommending reallocating some of their administrative costs to the enterprise funds. Uh, when possible. So the total reductions are just under 600,000. Uh, the, fire, the fire department's target was 1.15 million. Uh, they did propose a limp freezing three firefighter positions if they become vacant. So we will evaluate that throughout the, the year if they have any vacancies. And they also propose um, reductions in the Marine Rescue Program in fire prevention and EMS, and then distributing the Office of Emergency Services to all funds. So as we found out in the recent fire, um, the, the OES also worked in the enterprise funds. So we uh, are distributing that to those funds. So total reductions for them are 295,000. The police department has had the largest target of 1.7 million. Uh, they're proposing uh, a reorg um, for one of their divisions and that's the, the ranger positions. Uh, they proposed eliminating 12 ranger positions for almost 1.3 million. And they would like to offset that by adding six community service officer positions for um, just under 600,000. I think the chief will be here later and he can speak to um, the reason for the reorganization. They also proposed eliminating a vacant crime analyst position and a victim advocate position and that position is filled. Uh, other reductions were, are in community services, records, investigations and administration for a total reduction of 1.7 million. And as you can see in the note, the Council Budget Committee also had a concern in this area, so that's noted for you. Uh, the Parks Department um, had a target of 883,000. They proposed 212,000 in position eliminations. One is a vacant special events coordinator and there's a half-time vacant box office representative other reductions um, are, are mostly one time due to the pandemic and the, park, the recreation department not running their uh, programs. So the total is 1.1 million. The economic development department had a target of 361,000. They recommended eliminating one vacant arts manager position and then they proposed reductions in project administration and downtown services. Uh, one of the downtown services is sidewalk waste, waste removal was recommended to move to the kiosk, kiosk maintenance fund. And then there's a reduction in properties ma management for total reductions of three, just under 350,000. The planning and community development department had a target of 421,000. They proposed uh, eliminating three and a half vacant positions, a building inspector, an administrative assistant to a code compliance specialist and a half-time associate planner. They also had other reductions of around 105,000 in administration, current planning, advanced planning, building and safety and the rental program. So their total reductions are just over half a million. And for some, you know, for I think almost every department, there are recommended reductions in travel and training, mostly because we're not um, able to participate in that right now. So with, with the proposal in front of you tonight, this is the updated management partners forecast. 
Um, so as you can see, the red line for 1920, because we took so many one-time measures with reserve funds, we got closer to our reserve line, but then it drops off again next year. So this, with this proposal here, it's uh, implementing 3.75 million in ongoing savings starting in fiscal 2022. The lowest fund balance is estimated around 60% of the goal. And then the goal would be restored in 2026. So you can see that red line come up um, to meet the blue line then. And then in 2028, we could restore 2 million in cuts, um, you know, some kind of cuts or a budget increase at that time. And the, all of these proposals depend on, you know, the cuts being ongoing and sustainable. So one-time cuts help us for the year, but to, to really make this work, they need to be sustainable. I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Laura at this time. Yeah, actually, can I just say one quick thing, Laura, before you start? Um, I just wanted to just really quickly just po uh, point out a couple of things, and that is that, uh, you know, what we're having to do really is unprecedented in the sense that uh, we've never faced a situation where we've had to make this level of cuts this quickly. Um, and uh, so it's very hard to to do it in, in a way that uh, is uh, what we normally would do in terms of the, the, the vetting process and in terms of the discussions because it had to be really accelerated in, the, in, in order to uh, make the cuts in, 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 in a timely fashion to address our fiscal situation. Um, and so it's very, very hard, but I can tell you that the departments work really, really hard to come up with uh, options that really, to the extent that we could as much as possible, uh, limited impacts to essential services and to our employees. Um, and that it's virtually impossible to do something that's uh, exactly equivalent for every single department uh, given you know, all the factors that have to be taken into account for, for that. And so uh, I do want to uh, thank, you know, our, our, our leadership team and, and our employees who uh, have worked uh, really hard to try to come up with options. Um, the work isn't done yet, unfortunately, uh, but again, just highlight that the, this is really unprecedented uh, and, and unfortunate, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but uh, something that we're just sort of forced to do at this particular point in time. Thank you, Martine. Um, as as uh, City Manager Bernal said, as we transition from fiscal year 21 to fiscal year 22, we'll start looking at longer term options for budget solutions. So if you'll recall, call in our August the 18th update from management partners, they had quite a few solutions on the revenue and expenditure side, but many of those could not be turned around in the eight to nine weeks that we had to be able to get to um, the actual solutions to, for the departments to be able to try to beat that $6 million mark. So as we start planning for fiscal year 22, we'll be looking at revenue, uh, having conversations with the council and the budget committee and among staff as far as any November 2021 ballot measure that we might entertain. And then additionally, if you'll recall from management partners, they did recommend that we start to look at the delivery of our services and how much it costs us to deliver those services compared to how much we're charging for them. So the more those are a one-to-one, -one, we get to fuller cost recovery. And we have many instances where we are falling short on the cost recovery of how much our services uh, go into the service that we give to the community versus how much we're actually charging. So we'll start to look at that over the next few months as well. On the expenditure side in fiscal year 22 for personnel, we will relook at the vacancies, especially trying to focus on any vacancies that are out there and eliminating those. If we freeze the position for one year, that's a one time, it does not help us sustain that uh, fund balance that we need and the reduction of our core expenditures. We need to eliminate vacant positions. And then we'll also have the department look at those retirement positions that are frozen right now. Those will unfreeze come fiscal year 22 and those could be, um, those could help us toward the sustainable solutions that we need to find. On the service delivery side, there were several recommendations about consolidating and looking at different ways to do our liability and workers' compensation. 
uh, efforts, those are spread between the finance and human resources departments right now. Also looking at our management and analytical capacity and any other departmental service delivery efficiencies that we can find. Finance continues to look at our professional services and miscellaneous services and doing a really deep level analysis of those expenditures and seeing how we might be able to control those on a year in, year out basis. So we'll continue that work in fiscal year 22. And then just overall looking at fundamental sustainable service adjustments. And in some of those cases, we may need to come back to you to have conversations if those are going to affect services to the community to get your feedback because making fundamental changes of these sorts um, has to have some impact on the services that we deliver and those will often manifest themselves to the community and also to one another if we're internal service providers. So that's what we're looking for for fiscal year 22. And with that, I don't know, Martine, if you had any final comments as we turn it over to council for questions. The department heads are all on the line and available to help though. No, thank you. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to Mayor Cummings. All right, thank you all for that presentation. I want to look to council to see if there's any council members that currently have questions. And again, um, my uh, thoughts are that we can focus on um, items that are not related to the, the um, park rangers, so that we can have those discussions first. And then if there's any discussion to be had about the park rangers, we can save that so that council member Matthews can refuse herself. So with that, uh, I'll turn it over to council member Matthews. The city manager did mention, and I wanted to bring up here, what's the appropriate time to add in um, an allocation for the city county task force on university growth? Um, you, you mentioned it briefly in the city council category, and that amount would be 20,000 for our share of that, that uh, project. Yes, what I would what I would suggest is uh, is that when you when you do your um, motion on the, the captions around the budget, uh, separating out the Ranger one when you when you do the, the main motion that includes all mm -hmm. the items that you included in there as an addition. I, my understanding is it's a twenty three thousand uh, dollar request. Uh, that's I think that's what that's what I would recommend just including it in the main motion. Yeah. And and just to refresh the council members and public, um, this is. Um, a task force that was set up at council direction. Um, it has participation and funding from both the city and the county. The task force is composed of um, council members, coming um, Brown and myself with, with city staff, and then on the county side, um, county supervisor um, Ryan Kennedy and uh, staff support there. And um, the task force um, is directing, um, and there's an advisory council too, uh, community response to the university's long-range development plan coming up um, and how we can have the city's voice heard, uh, I think it's really important. So that will get added in at the appropriate time. We also have uh, the Director Butler, who's the staff person uh, on the yeah. uh, I don't know if uh, we if you wanted to add anything. I would just add that um, the um, the proposal included two options, a five-month proposal and a six-month proposal. Um, and so um, the amount that um, Councilmember Matthews cited was the five-month proposal at 20000 and then the six-month proposal was at $24,000. Um, and um, I can um, look and see what the county did. The county um, recently approved funding and um, I don't know off the top of my head if they did the five months. Did Cynthia look like they did, they did twenty thousand? Yeah. They did twenty thousand. Thank you. Yeah, so we can match that. Councilmember Byers. Um, thank you. Um, you know, I, I want to start at the uh, beginning here of the, all the departments. I had no questions on finance. Human Services, City Attorney, City Manager's Office. Uh, then I, where am I? But I do, uh, Northern 
fire. Okay, Public Works Department. By the way, I did uh, talk to Mark Dettel today for a while and got most my questions answered. Uh, as I couldn't figure out what that merchant fee was about. Uh, one I didn't ask, and I don't see mentioned here, the, uh, the Slow Street Project, uh, which, you know, a lot of us implemented now, I think just a few streets, and so many more want it. Uh, I, I believe the request was a lot more, than, and we cut it down to, what, 20000 Is there money to do uh, more streets? I didn't see a one-line budget on it. It probably was way in the back, but I didn't get that. Far. No, we. Um, I think it was thirty thousand. That was, was put thirty, the, maybe. The yeah. Um, we fully implemented this at this point. As far as uh, it's interesting, the feedback we're getting from uh, the streets that have those streets, and then the the neighboring streets. It's it's fairly mixed. Um, not all positive, as as we're not surprised. <laughs> And there's been a lot of maintenance as far as trying to relocate those, um, the equipment back into the pay, into this into the location they're initially set at. I guess they're getting moved, so it seems to, to be taking a little more staff time than people thought. As well, um, we're working with the neighborhood captains to try to take on that activity. But at this point, we're not recommending an expansion. So that would be the answer to that. Okay. Yeah, you're right about their. Uh, a lot of positive and there are some negatives but the positives one um, to me are worth looking at but I know we're not going to increase it right now let's see I um, you know the money for one and nine I can't is it one and nine yes um, are we having to fund that our cell, uh, our city budget or did we get enough grants to cover that whole intersection you know there's no the general fund money isn't really in that in one and nine, it's more traffic impact fee money that's there, and there are grant money that we that we receive from the state. So, um, I don't believe there's any general fund money in at this point. Now, if there's a, if if it's decided to expand um, one and nine and buy that whole property to do uh, housing on that property, oh yeah, um, on the central home, then that might take additional funding. But for the uh, traffic improvements, I believe that's all covered with traffic impact fee and the grants. Oh, good. Oh, sorry about that. Um, hold on a second. Oh, um, the other one, okay, I think that's all for public works. Um, next is, uh, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, uh, skip all the police right now or just the ranger part? Justin, I didn't quite understand just that. Just the rangers. So if you have questions about the victim advocate or any other questions regarding police. Right. I don't think, I will note that um, the chief had um, previously scheduled, was previously scheduled to attend a town hall hosted by the DA's office, so he's not available until after 7 p.m. So if you have questions that Andy might need to answer, I think it might be best to wait until he's able to be on the call after 7. Got it. Uh, I also, um, I want to go back to fire. I did talk to also to, uh, Jason and got most of my questions answered. Uh, in fact, I got them all answered and I had a bunch of them. Okay, next is police. Parks and Rec. Tony left him a message. I think, I think we talked. Um, what are my questions there? Under Parks and Rec. Yeah. Uh, when I got it, it several calls, I, not proposing anything, but uh, with so many of the class, I mean, uh, I'm sorry that Loud Nelson or somehow we can't offer a lot more classes. I think people are, you know, need classes now. They can't go anywhere, but Zoom classes coming out of uh, the library is doing some, but I wish Loud Nelson could do many that they used to do. Uh, and I understand people aren't going to go there, and I'm not suggesting Mount Nelson be open, but if anybody in the rec world can think of how to offer classes within your budget, I think the community would be appreciated. Oh, on their economic development, I know I need some, um, Martine, I need some history on this. When did uh, transferring TOT to economic development happen? Is, is that? Um, for some reason, I can't start my video. Um, it just says the house.
comes to stop it. Uh, oh, but I'll, I'll I can hear you. The question. I'll answer the question. You can hear me. Yeah. Uh, uh, there we go. I can start it now. Thank you. Uh, so that is a result of a um, uh, ballot initiative. It was a general purpose ballot measure uh, that was approved uh, by the voters when we went from a 10% tax uh, to an 11%. And the council uh, committed to using that uh, for economic development purposes. And that's why we created an internal economic development trust fund. So the general, it's a general fund revenue but we've been dedicating it towards economic development purposes. That's and so that is a result of that uh, ballot measure. And I don't know if Bonnie wants to add anything more to that, but we've been tracking it that way. Um, and we have, you know, what we try to do is that when things get better, we try to make up for it. We've done that in the past with respect to when we had the last recession, we actually did some of that with our Measure H funding, uh, again, because we were in such dire, uh, uh, situations, and then we, we made up for that. We can't do that again with Measure H because we've since then issued bonds to pay off the uh, and to do street work, uh, and so it's largely mm -hmm. tied up in that. Um, right. And, and, and Director Bonnie, if you want to add anything, Bonnie. Um, thank you, um, Martini. Yes, I, I would just like to add that we also created at the time as redevelopment was being terminated. And so it was a recognition of continuing some of the work that we were doing in the community, particularly also a concern about affordable housing. So the overall fund is a combination of funding both for affordable housing and for economic development initiatives that were approved by the council under our implementation plan. So for example, work in the downtown, specifically um, improvements to Ocean Street, uh, Water Street, downtown, um, Pacific Avenue improvements specifically related to Metro and the Metro project and the wayfinding or some of the projects, for example, that have been funded over time out of the ED Trust Fund. Okay. And, and I would add that, that uh, the recommendations before you are such that uh, we wanted to make sure that uh, no major housing or economic development projects were, are impaired by uh, this uh, um, temporary transfer. Again, it's just an attempt to, to get us through these difficult times. I'm sure I voted for that uh, TOT, but thank you for that background. <laughs> I just didn't know when it happened and uh, it all makes sense. Uh, but you know, by, you do have a lot of money in that pot, like three and a half million, something like that. I mean, Right we, we actually, with the transfer, we um, the actual available cash balance is under 800000 at this point. So with the million transfer, um, we have, with the committed funds that have already been approved by council, the actual balance is just a little under 800000 So the committed funds are some of the projects downtown that we're building? The, uh, um, they're the ones housing. that I'm... Yes, they're the ones that I mentioned. So specifically, we have funding set aside for the Metro project. Right. Um, we have funding for Pacific Avenue, lower Pacific Avenue improvements specifically related to the Metro project. We have some funding earmarked for Ocean Street improvements. Okay. And we have, yeah, some, so we have similar projects, the wayfinding project that's under underway right now and a few other similar projects. Yeah, that so way improved. Oh, thank you, sorry to interrupt. Thank you. Uh, the wayfinding, is that the one we did all that work of putting new signs all over town? Is that the way to find they're, they're actually being um, installed right now. So this has been Ooh. a long project in the work. So yes, it's, it's gone okay. through uh, iterative design phase and then was was stalled and um, now it's finally being, being implemented and installed and so it's, it's pretty exciting. But it's the okay. second generation, Catherine, because we, we said it once <laughs> years ago, and this is the second generation. <laughs> okay, yeah, I know it's, it's been around a long time and it comes and goes, so I'm glad you mentioned it because I probably would start uh, noticing the sign. Um, good, thank you, Bonnie. Let me see, I think that's uh, uh, all I had there. Yeah, we don't need the trolley for sure. Uh, thanks, Bonnie. I think that's all. Um, the only one I had for planning, uh, it all made sense, which uh, Lee, you've outlined. But I did have a question about our rental inspection. This is just an opportunity for me to get updated on some projects because we don't run into each other in the halls that I would normally just ask these. Uh, where are we in the rental inspection? Are we full steam ahead? Is it on hold? Are you uh, talking about in the COVID environment, Councilmember Byers? 
Well, in, first in general, and yes, is it different under COVID? I don't know, yeah. Sure. Um, so yes, we are continuing with the rental inspection service. Uh, we have not proposed any cuts associated with that in large part. Um, yeah, that is fully funded by um, the uh, the fees that rental providers provide to us, and so you know, cutting positions there wouldn't uh, offer any general fund benefits. And we are still um, inspecting residences, um, and um, we are also offering, upon request, um, remote inspections for those. And so if, if people want to use FaceTime or Zoom or other means uh, by which to allow us to go in and do a remote inspection if they're um, uh, concerned about COVID issues. And so we do offer that now as well. Uh, I think one of the reduction was, uh, it was it a code enforcement position? Remind me about. Yes, there there is a code enforcement officer, and that is that's the same um, classification title as our rental inspectors. Uh, we would not be eliminating um, one of the two rental inspectors that we have. This is one of the three code enforcement officers that we have, and so there would be implications in terms of um, you know delays on enforcement actions or um, sending letters um, rather than doing site visits, um, particularly for, we've got categories of concern, um, you know, with category one being life safety issues and, and category four going down to things like um, weeds or in areas that, you know, aren't fire prone or, um, things like too many chickens on a property, you know, so those lower level um, concerns might just be getting letters instead of the, the site visits. Good. Oh, okay. Thanks, Lee. Thanks for those uh, updates for me. That's all my questions, Mayor, right now. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins and Council Member Brown, and I have a few questions myself. Uh, thank you. I, I think my question maybe would be for um, for Martine. I, I was wondering, maybe this is a question about what we could think about right now, but in the long term, about how much we, um, how much the city leases for office space, and if it's been looked at as a potential kind of cost savings to have folks working from home or a reuse of city-owned properties um, in terms of the lease spaces we have for, for office space. I would say certainly the uh, the pandemic has uh, you know obviously yeah. provided uh, uh, a different uh, work environment that um, I think lends itself uh, in some applications and in some departments to uh, perhaps different models uh, and not in others. So it just really depends. Uh, there will be an opportunity to do that in that uh, right now, for example, we don't house all of our departments in uh, city-owned facilities. The the big exception right now is the the finance department, which is in the NIAC building although it is paying rent to our housing trust fund. Um, so it's, it's in a way it's actually helping us uh, for, towards housing. But I think it will provide the opportunity for us to relook at that as uh, that facility has to turn over. And as we look at uh, how um, the telecommuting or the teleconferencing or video conferencing is working in, in the organization. Um, and I think a lot of organizations are having to do that. So yes, we'll, we'll look at that. Okay, okay, thanks. That's all I have, and then I'll have more questions later. Councilmember yeah. Brown. Thank you. So I got most of my questions answered in the budget committee. So um, I just have a couple based on the read of the, the full packet that we received for this meeting. Uh, so the first one is, um, I actually have two for planning, um, and they're really just uh, clarifying questions. Uh, the first is, um, in, as I, I understand that there, we are eligible for a $300,000-ish grant from AMBAG for the REAP, the REAP program, uh, which is Regional Early Access Planning, and I'm wondering, is that in this budget? Is, that, is there any an, an, an anticipation of getting that? Are we applying for it? Kind of what, what's going on with that one. And the other one, just really quickly, is um, it's item 281 on page 60. I just don't know what it is. I'm trying to, like, I can't, like, I couldn't 
come up with uh, something that made sense for the acronym, the S-A-L-H-I-H, L-H-I-H, uh, merged fund. What, what are those two about? I will, uh, I'll jump on the first question and I'll ask uh, Sarah DeLeon uh, to jump on the specifics of that second one. Um, so with regards to the REAP grant, we actually have three um, sizable grants that um, we have um, recently applied for, one of which we've been granted, um, it's $310,000 um, and that was the SB2 grant for the objective standards work. And we have, um, we have budgeted about 180,000. Um, there's some flexibility there, but about 180,000 that could come in to the city for um, uh, reimbursement um, of costs. Uh, we also have 300,000 that's coming from um, uh, the LEAP grant and that is going towards the um, housing element. And then um, the council approved if there's extra funding associated with that for that to go to um, the expansion of the downtown. The REAP grant we're actually bringing to you on this coming Tuesday with a request to apply for an expansion of the downtown. Um, and uh, the, the REAP and the LEAP are both 300,000. There will be some portion of that that um, it can go towards um, staff reimbursement um, as, as uh, it reimburses staff time. There will also be significant consultant costs um, with uh, both of those, but there is some um, staff reimbursement that would be anticipated. Um, those, because um, they are one-time grants, they haven't been built into the cuts associated with this, but we're hoping that what that does is it, it essentially will serve as revenue to us and offset some of the expenditures that we have once we get those um, reimbursements back from the state. So it is funding that we're, we um, are expecting, but it isn't built into the budget um, specifically here because we'll still have those um, staff cost expenses. So that'll all just be reflected then in the next budget update or at whatever point they're kind of confirmed and uh, designated. Yeah, we'll have, we'll have uh, offsetting revenue coming back in for those. And I believe, um, Sarah, is that the, uh, if you can give the acronym, is that the strong motion fee, uh, Sarah? Oh, you're muted, Sarah. Sorry, Council Member Brown, what page were you looking at? It's page um, 60, item 281. Thank you, I was looking at, I was trying to find 281. I'm sorry about that, item 281. Yeah. And the acronym you see is? It's S-A-L-H-I-H merged. Okay. Yeah, I'm not seeing that. Um, that doesn't look like strong motion to me, Lee. Yeah. Let me take a look and I can get that because I'm it, not seeing it on page it, 60. It's, um, uh, maybe, is it page 60? I thought it was page It's 60. attachment number six. It's an attachment six. six. Gotcha, and, I'm uh, scrolling. Uh, Item 261. It, it, low and moderate income house funds. Oh, 261, that, the community development block grant. That's what you're 281. saying? 281. No, it's 281. Under, it's, it's at the top oh, I of. See. Yeah. yeah, Lee, that one says low and moderate income housing. I'm not sure which one that, that is. That's not our a fund that I look at. Yeah, those are funds under economic development. Yeah. Okay, so those are, it's just, is that a, a special grant? Is that, sorry, I just am trying to figure out what it's for and, you know, how it works. Yeah, so the low mod income housing fund is actually a holdover from redevelopment and how we, um, how those are categorized and described. Thank you. Um, and then I have a few, just a few questions related to revenues and uh, how they're kind of, uh, accounted for more generally, um, and I and I'm sorry to announce this during the subcommittee. We did talk a lot about not planning in anticipated funding, uh, stimulus funding, or CARES Act, or anything like that. Who knows what's going to happen in Washington? But I am wondering is how we're accounting for, uh, and I know bracket, and so I'm I'm not questioning any of that. But um, how we're accounting for FEMA reimbursements? Are they are they in here? Or is there 
um, you know, what, what would that mean for uh, some of the areas that um, maybe uh, are going to need some some uh, additional uh, resources as a result of the emergencies that we've been uh, that have been hitting us hard. I can try to answer that, and then uh, uh, Kim or uh, Chief uh, Hyduk wants, wants to ask if they can do that. So basically, uh, the FEMA reimbursement process uh, is not an immediate reimbursement process. So there's a, a lot of paperwork and forms and the applications that have to be submitted, and then it takes a while to, to receive the funds. Um, so uh, we, since we don't know, and also they have to approve what's what the we get reimbursed, so we don't budget, at this point, don't have enough information to, to specifically budget a precise amount or to even know when we're gonna get those funds. Uh, but we are preparing, uh, like many agencies are right now, preparing for reimbursements to submit those. We may have already done some, but we're close to doing that. And then uh, we'll expect to hear in the in coming weeks or months. And I'll turn it over to Chief Haidu, who maybe can add more to that. Yeah, Council Member Brown. Um, so the FEMA reimbursement process is not immediate, and what they do uh, for different disasters that are declared, they set out criteria uh, by agency or by state, uh, depending on the uh, disaster. And so at the beginning of the COVID um, response, we opened up the EOC and we made sure that we are tracking all of our expenditures as it relates to COVID. Uh, we're working with the FEMA consultant and we will be applying um, our cost, and then there'll be a, a process for which ones are actually approved and when those funds are dispersed. And so it, we're not able to give you an exact number of what that is going to be, but we are in the process of trying to make sure that we can recapture all the expenditures as they related to COVID to the greatest extent possible. Uh, thank you. So I think, um, and yeah, I kind of knew that, but I just was wondering if there was any way to kind of capture what that is going to look like or, you know, not the exact amount, but how much um, we're looking at. I mean, how much we, the city um, uh, had in unanticipated costs as a result, um, but I'll, I'll wait till that becomes more clear. And um, I think that was all. I have comments on the the city manager's budget, but I'll save those for later. Adam, I had a couple questions real quick. I was wondering um, maybe if the presentation could be put back up and if the slide that had the shortfalls on it could be presented again. Do you want, uh, Mayor, are you talking about the updated forecast slide? I think that's the right one. There's one slide in the presentation where it showed the, the shortfalls, which was $665,271. Yeah. Oh, the, the, the table that had the, uh, the different categories of cuts and then the shortfalls. Uh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. slide came up um, made note that there was supposed to, some of that shortfall was supposed to be made up with I think it was economic development funds or funds from some other source on the order of 400 plus thousand so I just wanted to get a sense of what are the actual shortfalls because does that does this number include that 400,000 or is there the 400,000 you know it by adding in that 400,000 then it brings that shortfall down even further. That, that's correct. It's uh, uh, the latter in that uh, this does not include the $400,000 transfer. So the actual short call would be more like 265000 And uh, Kim, you can correct me if I got that wrong. No, that's correct. Okay, thank you. And then there was another, there was the other slide with the additions. I was wondering if you could just put that slide up too. The, the, can you say that again? I think that's the city manager slide. Yeah. Oh. So. The economic hardship program. So I was also curious, because I was going through this and I didn't see the tenant sanctuary program, which I know we were also talking about maintaining that funding as well. And so I was just wondering where the funding falls out for tenant sanctuary. I, 
That is actually included in the budget already. Um, I had netted that against some of the other uh, reductions. So that is included in the detailed spreadsheet if you look at the attachment four. You'll find tenant sanctuary is listed in there as funded. Right. And that's, that's because council had directed that that be included in the budget uh, in previous Correct. action. Okay. Um, I'll work through that, but thanks. I just wanted to clarify because I wasn't sure where that was. Um, in terms of my questions, I think that's all I have for now. And so I'll just move on to Councilmember Matthews and then uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Just a couple of quick comments. Um, Sandy asked about the SA LHH merge. I think that Salvation Army um, uh, low income housing, which was a big chunk of money, came in at the time of the earthquake and has carried forward, and we whittled away at it and used it for projects. So I'm sure that's what the SA is. And just in reference to Catherine's question about um, transferring TOT um, percentage into economic development, that that followed when the governor did away with redevelopment. You know, we, previously it was the redevelopment department, and then at some point it became redevelopment and economic development both. We did away with the redevelopment. It's now solely economic development and housing. So that was a way to sustain the economic development department. So it was, it was about that same time. Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, I just want to thank um, staff for the presentation and also um, Mayor Cummings and Council Member Brown. Um, I think we work together well as a budget committee. Um, I have a couple questions, um, actually just one for Public Works. Um, Mark, if you're still available. Um, yep. Just want to understand, I know we're doing the flood work right now, the pre Pre uh, vegetation management, um, do we are, are we ready for a flood <laughs> if one comes this year? I'm just curious about how we're looking at that um, in terms of managing that through this winter, um, and whether or not you have the, you feel you have the resources to sustain something if if something does happen. Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty with the fires and the impacts of the potential debris flow mm -hmm. that we may see depending on the rains that we get this year. Um, what we're doing with the, um, after we do the vegetation management, we're gonna go in and rip the channel um, like we usually do, but we're gonna rip it deeper than we normally do. So if we get some high flows, we'll move even more material out of there to, to uh, allow capacity, uh, maximum capacity for flows. The biggest concern is debris. And, mm -hmm. and the, really the biggest area for us is the Highway 1 bridge. bridge. Um, it's the last bridge with a, with a center span. And that is what wiped out our Soquel Bridge um, when we lost that bridge. Um, the debris, the logs that can come down and get lodged against that center span, span build up a dam and that water pressure will push that bridge over. So we've been working with Caltrans to alert them of this condition. The county has a task force that they've set up that, met, that meets weekly on Zoom to talk about these debris flows, because it's really, a, a, that's a major concern for us and depending on what the winter is going to be. Um, Caltrans is participating in that call, so they have, I have put them on notice of that issue. And as it starts the rainy season, we may have to close that area down to, if they need to get mobilized equipment on the bridge to move that debris. So we'll be working closely with them, but that is a real concern for us during this winter. And is there anything, Mark, I know that, uh, I know the channel, the channel has essentially the O and the operations and maintenance of the system now is basically, we, we own the car now, right? The key, the we game, do. Keys. <laughs> we um, do. So the feds have given us the keys. Um, are we eligible for any pre kind of pre-disaster kinds of things that we could get through our federal reps or is there anything that the, the core is 
available to us at all in terms of you know possibly going in and making adjustments throughout the as, as storms come through you know i mean i would imagine that if we get a heavy winter we're going to even need to be going in and doing things you know even just to get through the season but i'm just curious if there's any any need for that kind of advocacy or uh if, if there's additional funding that may be needed to sort of get us through the entirety of the winter yeah, I'm not sure about the funding, but we definitely have a good working relationship now, and um, I'll reach out to their emergency services uh, representative just to put them on notice. Um, they have had a change in personnel, and it's a new person that starts next week, but we'll make those contacts. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I appreciate um, just moving ahead. If we can, you know, anytime you feel it's appropriate, getting updates in terms of, you know, you know, the potential that we're looking at would be really helpful. Okay. Um, I think those are, uh, that's my um, main question when I was looking through all the detail work, I, I thought I want to make sure that we had, we had some uh, plan around that. So um, uh, that's my, uh, that's my question. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. I was looking through attachment four and I still, I don't know if there's someone on staff here who can clearly point out which item on attachment four is related to this tenant sanctuary because I've gone over a number of times and can't seem to identify and I just think, I just want to make sure that it's clear because I know that this was an item of concern and, you know, if members of the public are asking, I think it would be just good that we can, you know, point them to the right item. It's, it's, it's labeled row number seven under, if you look under, there's a blue bar that says city manager's office target 388,000. And, and then just below that row number seven. Okay, I was looking at that. phrase in there says fund tenant legal services per council direction on July 2nd. Thanks, I think I, think I might have misheard you and was looking at attachment four, so in the attachment three. Thanks for that clarification. No worries. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it looks like uh, the police chief's on, so I wonder if there's any questions that are police related that are not related to the Rangers. If we can start with those questions, if, if council members have any questions for police. Um, I have a question around the victim's advocate position, and I was um, wondering um, what would what would be the plan for um, helping victims of crime navigate the criminal justice system if this position were to be um, eliminated. Oh, good after good evening, uh, Councilmember Golder. That's a good question. So we've already spoken with the district attorney's office, and the district attorney's office believes that they can handle additional workload. Should that actually be the case, we have also uh, have the provision that that could consume one of the vacated or one of the CSO positions if that became a priority for the department and the and the community. Uh, in addition to that. Um, uh, we have a volunteer working over there, but that will certainly not replace uh, uh, that, uh, the quality of the work that has been done by that individual. Thank you. Are there any other questions for the police chief uh, regarding um, police? Oh, okay, Council, Council Member Byers. And you're currently muted, Catherine. Yeah, when I spoke to you, you, well, you talked about how the county does have that facility or that capability to do that. Um, is, is it complicated? I mean, somebody within the city, it, are they located easy access? Because some of these things are quite dreadful and you want some advocate fast or help out. Sure. Do you know much about their department? Yeah, they have a, a few uh, victim advocates that work uh, with oh. mostly pre-trial and trial uh, victims. And uh, so they are able to help people walk through the cases. Uh, now, there are some things that uh, they don't do that we currently are doing. And I'll 
uh, frankness that uh, I think that uh, is, so it is a valuable position uh, that could also be trans, uh, transferred to one of the CSO positions should that become available. Okay. We are the only police agency not uh, in the county that has a victim advocate. So that CSO, should you find the need, would need some training, I assume? Or? Well, this person could be transferred uh, over to one of those positions. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, Council Member Golder. Um, Chief Mills, you said uh, there's some, some services that are different. Can you speak to those just a little bit? Sure. Um, the victim advocate here, for instance, does use U visas. Uh, those are people who have been victims of domestic violence or violent crime that we apply on their behalf, if they're immigrants uh, or uh, to our country, on behalf of them to the federal government for access to citizenship. Um, there's a, a great, little bit greater level of follow-up that we do here in terms of working with them before issuing case issuing and finding resources for them afterward. Uh, so uh, our victim advocate does a phenomenal job. And that again, can continue as part of the CSO uh, program. I think that was just um, some of the letters that we received were so heartbreaking and touching. And it was, it's really hard to imagine that position not being, um, there for people in their time of need. So it's really um, a difficult decision. Totally understand that. Mayor Myers. Good evening, Chief Mills. Um, I just I just need a little bit of clarification um, tracking all these numbers here. Is there a cost savings that will be realized by um, eliminating this position, but then trans, but then it sounds like th this, the, the duties of the victim services advocate could be done under a CSO position. I'm just trying to get a sense of what, what why what, the cost savings aspect to it, um, I guess is my main question at this point. Yeah, no, I totally understand your question. And so uh, if this person would go over, it would consume one of the uh, CSO positions that we are increasing over there. Mm -hmm. So that'd be a net decrease for then for uh, potentially one of the rangers coming over. And this would be a competitive process where we would interview all of those that are interested uh, in those positions. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Brown. So just a quick follow-up. Hi, Chief Mills. Um, I, uh, I, we've had a couple of conversations about this one-on-one uh, -on -one in the budget committee. And uh, so my only other question, I guess, since uh, uh, Council Member Golder brought it up, is in, in that process, um, if the, and you know, it's hard to talk about cutting positions when they're real people attached to them and you know them and they're doing an amazing job. Um, so I, I'm just wondering, in terms of how you see that process working, if the reclassifications happen, would there be like an interruption in uh, the services one and, and this particular person's employment? Um, what, what are you anticipating that might look like? Well, for, uh, thank you for acknowledging that this is extraordinarily difficult to think about people that are in life positions, and it has been difficult and very cathartic. Um, uh, for our employees, and that's that's my main concern. So I spoke with uh, our human resource director about this, and our full goal is to be able to transition people without a break in service or without a break in services. And so we would wanna make sure that if this is done as seamlessly as possible, and we think that we, that can be accomplished. Thank you, that's, that's really important, thank you. Okay, are there any other council members who have questions regarding police department or other departments, but anything that's not related to uh, the park rangers? Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a question for um, Director Elliott from Parks. 
Are you there, Tony? Yep, I'm here. Hi, Tony. Um, I had a question um, regarding the Surf Museum. I've gotten quite a few questions about that, um, some concerns from some of the longtime folks who work, you know, work to put that together. Um, it's a temporary, so, but it is through June of 2021. So it'll be basically, you know, for most, for the entirety of the rest of the fiscal year. Um, it says the museum temporary staffing. Um, is that staffing people sitting in the museum or is that people taking care of the museum and its contents or what, what is that staffing? Yeah, that's our temporary staffing uh, that essentially opens the museum and runs the museum operations uh, so that it's accessible for the public. Um, Mary is our staff member over there, if you know Mary. Do you know Mary? So that value is, uh, or the cost is about $27,000 per year. Uh -huh. So part of our reduction proposal includes uh, a one-time reduction, so it would be this fiscal year of 27,000, which would keep the surfing museum closed uh, because we don't have that staffing um, uh, person there to unlock it and run the run the operations of the museum. Um, we have, uh, I know, historically worked with uh, the community, the Surfing Preservation uh, Society, the Longboard Union, uh, both, I think, on a fundraising standpoint and a volunteer standpoint. So uh, our hope is that that would be something that we don't keep closed. Obviously, it's on our uh, on our logo, on our shirts, uh, the, the lighthouse. So it's something that we know is near and dear uh, to our community and iconic for Surf City USA. So we wanna keep that open and we may be able to find uh, alternative service delivery um, uh, through volunteerism or donations. And um, I know that the Natural History Museum, which is now not under city, um, any city support, um, I know that they've had a long history there too. Um, and in fact, um, they actually, uh, I believe, continue to help staff or provide, there, there's a relationship there with some of the, um, the gift shops, I believe. Um, it, it, have you reached out to them at all to see if there's any way that, or any interest in them potentially keeping, keeping that, that staffing open in terms of having the, the facility accessible? Yeah, we haven't yet. I think that's a great suggestion though, and you're right. They've got a, a partnership with us in the Surfing Museum through the retail component. Mm -hmm. um, I've not talked with their executive director in the past couple weeks uh, to, to talk about that, but I think that's a great suggestion. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, it, it is an iconic place. It's certainly a place that, um, you know, people wanna see when they come and, um, if there's any way that our community partners can be reached out to to try to see if there's a way to keep that open, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Councilmember Golder. I was just going to piggyback on what um, Vice Mayor um, Meyer said and suggest is there a possibility that we could open more or have other retail opportunities or maybe just reduce the hours to? you know, weekends and one or two afternoons a week or something like that, just so that it's not entirely closed. Because I think if nobody's there, then it's just gonna collect dust and then um, eventually fall into a state of disrepair. And that would be a huge loss to our yeah, I totally agree. And yeah, I think all of those are options. We could stay open on weekends. We could, um, you know, reduce hours. I think there are a lot of opportunities there that we'll look at. Uh, in coordination with the surfing community, um, uh, Natural History Museum, and, and so forth. So, yeah, uh, hear your point, and yeah, appreciate that, and uh, we'll work on it. Councilmember Matthews. Thank you. I just want to second the interest in the surfing museum. It's so iconic, and it has been really significantly supported by. Uh, community volunteers, community fundraising, et cetera. So it seems to me that's almost worth a task force. That's a, of all the problems facing it, facing us, that one seems almost solvable. <laughs> so just an effort to keep that open. There's so much affection and interest. Um, I just want to say generally how much I appreciate the work of the committee that went into this and all the staff reading through the staff report. I think we all had the feeling, oh no, not that. Not that, 
but here we are. Um, and I mentioned a couple, the front page of the New York Times today is the uh, impact of COVID on state and local government and how we are just beginning to reel from the effects of this. So um, one of my thoughts going through this is, you know, just not to be blaming people. Um, everyone is so stressed, upset, and I think, you know, historically we have done our best in Santa Cruz and we will do our best. And none of this is going to be easy. There will be some compromises in service and some things we love we have to let go. But um, we all know <laughs> we were elected to be grown ups, you know. So um, just, I think this, as much as any time, calls on us to have a feeling of generosity kind of across the board. Um, because it's going to be so tough going through this as a community and take a good long while. Um, that's just an editorial comment. I put it in here. Um, and just uh, specifically not about the Rangers in general, but it overlaps with parks and with so many other departments that overlap with economic development. And, um, it's not a matter of the details of how it's provided, but um, my concern in a lot of these budget decisions is um, the reality and the perception of public safety. And um, we're pretty lean already, and I think that is going to be a challenge ahead of us. So um, there are a lot of ways to resolve that, but to me, that touches on so much of uh, the different departments and different services that we offer. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Brown. Uh, I'm just going to go back to the Lighthouse uh, Museum really quickly to uh, ditto, echo the comments that have been made, um, and also say, you know, having been involved when uh, in long, long ago, not as a member of the City Council, I've, I've seen this, we're at, we've been at this moment before where it was going to close entirely, and we've been able to find creative ways to um, you know, keep it open. And so I'm really glad to hear that those are all being considered. And I, um, having just recently um, been involved in the establishment of an Adopt-A-Park program over on the west side, um, you know, I'm, I'm really, I'm becoming a serious fan and I'm, um, you know, I'm hoping that um, we, maybe we can use uh, some of the energy around that. There's, you know, a lot of people over on the west side who I think uh, want to be, you know, want to, would, would, like to be involved if uh, if we reach out to them. So um, and and all over town. Um, so I definitely want to uh, you know do whatever I can to help with that. Stay in touch. Great. Are there any further comments on um, any item that's not related to the park rangers and council members? Uh, if that's the case, then maybe uh, Council Member Matthews, if you could step away and then we'll try to get in touch with you um, when we go into public comment. Yeah, and, and maybe I should just say now, get, again, for people who are just tuning in, that um, um, because my son is a park ranger, um, I've been advised and I agree that this, um, in the to be cautious about the appearance of conflict, I'm going to recuse myself from this part of the discussion. Thank you. Okay, so before we go to public comment, um, do any council members have questions specifically related to park rangers for a police chief? Councilmember Golden. So we also received a significant amount of correspondence regarding this item, and I think that the main questions that I have um, was if we don't eliminate the ranger program, what would the impact to the police department look like? Was there other alternatives? I know the main cost of the police department is personnel, so I'm sure it's other people, but maybe you could just speak a little more to that for us. Yeah, so I have, uh, if I understand your question correctly, is that uh, are there other things that could be eliminated instead of personnel? And the, the answer is no. Um, we are already eliminating as much as we possibly can. Uh, we've already
already uh, reduced uh, several positions in our patrol force because of uh, the first round. And now this is the second round, in which, which is more um, to be sought through the reorganization uh, so that it becomes more of a CSO, which expands their duties. Uh, the reality for us is, is about 80-some uh, uh, percent of our budget is personnel. But the rest of the budget that can't be eliminated is in support of personnel. So, for instance, NETCOM is over $2 million. Well, I, I can't touch NETCOM. Our uh, liability insurance for the police uh, because this is a high-risk profession, is a lot of money that can't be reduced. We still have to have fuel for our vehicles. Um, we looked at every line item in our budget to figure out what could possibly be reduced, uh, and this is uh, the best we could come up with. It is impossible for us to meet our targeted goal of $1.7 million without touching uh, real positions in our police department. And if I might add, we also eliminated as part of this uh, a couple of sworn positions. Uh, we also eliminated um, our positions from the POA, I should say. We also eliminated um, a crime analyst position that we were really looking forward to that could give uh, information to our community a lot quicker. We eliminated temp positions, including <clears throat> our homicide, one of our homicide investigators who does cold cases. Uh, this is a this was a very tough process, but it's not just the Ranger program, there's a lot of a lot of positions that are affected. I just have one other question. I know it's, it, you might not know the answer, maybe somebody else would, but maybe not, maybe someone could get back to me. Is there like a minimum standard for public safety um, across the country and like cities and towns where it's like a certain number of officers or personnel with the police department per, you know, thousand or for a population? So when uh, many police departments use the figure of two officers per 1,000 residents, uh, we do not uh, come close to that right now um, as a city. And uh, I think we're probably at about 1.5. I'd have to do the math real quickly. But uh, uh, so we're below that number. Now that is a number that many people use. However, it depends on the environment that you're in. Um, so certainly with us being the center of our universe here in Santa Cruz County, this is the hub, uh, as well as the tourist attractions. Well, that adds to it, uh, the amount of people that we're, we're placing in the university. But there are other things that take away from it. So uh, I think that we're managing uh, in terms of our ability to provide service, but I honestly don't believe that I can go lower uh, in our sworn ranks than what we currently uh, half. Yeah, I was thinking in my head because I know the population fluctuates here during, you know, holiday weekends and the summertime. It sometimes seems like there's double the amount of people in town. But, and the, you know, and so I was just curious. Thank you. you Council members Watkins and Brown and Byers. Yeah, my question I think is more for Martine. I was wondering if maybe you wanted to share a little bit about the history and context of where the Parks Rangers were in the Parks Department, then the movement to police and why, and so we're thinking about the kind of the impact or the results we want to see in regards to their service to the city. Sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to, and um, uh, Director Elliott can also uh, add add to, to the conversation of information. Uh, so, you know, it's it's uh, there's been you know uh, a bit of a of a challenge with respect to, to rangers because the rangers historically and traditionally uh, do work that's more related to uh, habitat conservation, uh, you know, doing tours, uh, uh, some level of maintenance, and, and sure they they also provide public safety related functions, but you know historically rangers when people think of them they they, they do they're not essentially a primary public safety function. That's not generally their principal duties. And so that's why historically you see them in parks uh, because they're part of the, the complement of, of park uh, personnel that provide some of those educational, uh, you know, ecological resource preservation services and functions. Uh, 
And, uh, but unfortunately in our city, uh, one of the things that we, that we face and have faced, and it's only gotten more, more challenging over the last few years, is, is having to deal with more public safety related uh, needs in our parks uh, as uh, the, our staff have just faced more challenging situations, unfortunately. And so because of that, there's been this sort of tension and back and forth uh, because when they were in the parks, uh, many of the rangers didn't feel like they had the, the appropriate training or uh, level of support that they needed to deal with the situations that we're confronting in the uh, parks department uh, or, in the, or in the downtown, for example. So there's always been this sort of uh, attempt to try to balance both things. Uh, and so that's principally uh, why they were then transferred over to the police department a few years ago, because that was just turning out to be more and more of a need. And the thought was that in the police department, uh, they would be able to uh, have the level of training and support that they need uh, to be able to, to function well. But it has created a tension because, you know, many uh, individuals that are in the uh, uh, parks and rec field, I'm sorry, in, in the ranger field, it's not quite a fit for them. Uh, we do actually have that function. Our water department has uh, rangers uh, that are within the department that they're able to do more basically function as, as, as rangers traditionally and do uh, because of the, there are you know, open spaces at Lock Moment, for example, uh, principally, but they don't have to face the same level of uh, issues that uh, our rangers do in, in the more urban environment. And so uh, because of that, again, they were moved over to the police department. And I think what the police department now faces is that, uh, and Andy can also add to this as well, Chief uh, Mills, is that uh, in the police department there too, they're also being uh, challenged with having the, proper, the appropriate level of skill sets and training and background also to deal with situations even under the, the, the purview of the police department. And I think one of the things that Chief Mills wants to try to accomplish is to, uh, in many ways, broaden uh, and provide also that balance because uh, even though they're more public safety skills, a lot of it too is also the fact that they need, uh, many times we don't, also don't need police officers to be the first ones to respond to, particularly cases where it's really a mental health, or it's, a, it's really a social services, human uh, uh, service or healthcare need. And so I think one of the things that the Chief Mills is trying to achieve is to provide some level of support for that. And I think in, in providing training to CSOs, we might be able to have the first responders be more, uh, be able to provide more of that level of support. And again, not have police officers be the first to go out and address a situation that really is more of a, of a human service related type issue. Uh, and so that's part of, I think, what we're trying to also try to evolve into. Ideally, uh, what many communities have done, and uh, we actually, and Mayor Cummings came on a tour with us when we went over to uh, San Mateo County, where there they actually have what are called hot teams, which are uh, the county has uh, teams comprised of caseworkers, mental health workers, outreach workers, who are the first responders to say if there's an encampment, the police actually uh, can call upon the hot team if they're contacted or an uh, individual or a business will actually call the hot team uh, first um, and they'll go out and uh, reach out to the homeless individuals in the encampments, offer services, shelter, assessments, uh, uh, and, and so forth. And then only if needed uh, are police actually called upon to assist. Um, and so I think that's something that we're certainly working towards uh, or trying to work towards with the county. Uh, the uh, larger uh, uh, focus strategies, uh, strategic plan that's being worked on, I think uh, looks to trying to create that model in our city where uh, there is that first level of support and then case management and, and diversion uh, within the system to get the individuals into you know, a better position as opposed to uh, sort of warehousing uh, the homeless or having a public safety response, uh, which is you know, not necessarily a good long-term solution. Um, and I think with respect to what we're trying to do as a city, I think, uh, I think Chief Mills wants to have a greater flexibility uh, and ability to kind of respond to those situations. And CSOs are what we can do within the context of what's available and the tools that we have as, as a city. Uh, but obviously it's not the full scope uh, of, of what we need to do. And we do have some level of, you know, we do have contracts with mental health workers, outreach workers that we also collaborate with and work with. But it's, 
not the ideal model. Um, but to get around to answering your question, I think uh, that's really been the tension and struggle with, with respect to particularly the park rangers who I think many times feel like they're doing public safety work uh, and they are public, doing public safety work and really don't have the appropriate public safety or even human services related uh, skill sets or, or training. And I'll, uh, I'll ask uh, see if uh, Chief Mills or, or uh, Director Elliott want to add to that. Go ahead, Tony. Sure. I was just going to try to provide a, a bit of that timeline, but uh, Martin, please jump in here if I'm incorrect on this. So, I think uh, I think prior to 2006 or seven, um, I think former Deputy Chief Rick Martinez was uh, a park ranger uh, going back, and then I think around 2007. Uh, Measure H was passed and provided funding for additional rangers through Parks and Recreation. Um, and then I believe the ranger program under Parks and Recreation really grew around 2016 or 2017. Uh, and my understanding is that time it was focused, the growth of the ranger program was focused on needs downtown in particular. And again, Martine or, or Chief, please chime in if that's incorrect. And then in yeah, yeah, just to, just to clarify a little bit. Yeah, Measure H, uh, which provided uh, funding for roads and for public safety uh, and parks public safety. Ironically, actually, that money was initially used to create a parks unit in the police department, which had a sergeant and CSOs. <laughs> and then, then we actually went to the ranger model and then we sort of kind of coming back to it. Uh, but uh, yeah, and then there, the other item that came up uh, after that was the need to have uh, more of uh, uh, presence downtown. And, and the thought was that the rangers would be yeah, a less uh, sort of police oriented presence than would a uh, 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 ranger. And then uh, let's see in 20, I believe 2017 or 2018, uh, Parks and Recreation had about 13 rangers, and I believe nine of those then went to the police department in 2018. And then uh, by 2019, three of the four remaining rangers that were in Parks and Recreation, uh, those positions moved over uh, to the police department uh, ranger program. So at the time, uh, three of the four positions in Parks and Rec were vacant. So we moved those vacancies over to the police department. Uh, the one position that remained in Parks and Recreation, we uh, repurposed or reclassed as a, um, um, a parks maintenance um, a position, a fuel crew leader in particular. So I think that's roughly uh, that that um, that evolution. I think the only other thing to add uh, with that is uh, what uh, the city manager uh, mentioned is that in order for us to um, expand the capabilities of what the rangers are currently assigned to do is, is to class them as a, as a CSO. And that is helpful in the, from the standpoint of if we're going to have them in more of a cahoots type model, uh, that's a precursor to what we can ultimately advance to or combining a mental health worker working with the ranger out in the field, uh, contacting people in a non-law enforcement manner uh, this is a perfect vehicle uh, to do that. And so that was uh, kind of some of the thinking for the evolution uh, to uh, the CSO model and the restructuring of how we currently view uh, the Ranger position. I, I just want, I appreciate your response and, and I think it's important for historical context to understand the impact and sort of the results we hope to achieve with some of these decisions. And as we move forward, I think we have an opportunity to really revisit ultimately what's the impact that we want to see and what's the appropriate response in that regard. So thank you. Okay, Council Member Brown. Yeah, uh, so it, in that vein, I um, I guess I, I do want to ask a question. I, I, first, I'll say, um, you know, I'm I'm really concerned about uh, this, I, and I'm I don't want to say that that doesn't mean to say that others are not. I'm I'm just I just want to say it because I, I you know the the feedback that we're getting from the public is is really really um, you know um, I think there's legitimate concerns that we we ought to we need to be able to address and we need to um, you know, be able to demonstrate that we're it's being handled so and I you know when I didn't really support the, the move 
uh, in the first place because I really was concerned that the you know Rangers traditional focus on environmental uh, environmental management um, would be diluted and um, it certainly has I don't think it was necessarily just because of the switch but because of the need in the city and limited resources um, but I, yeah I'm just concerned that we now don't have um, and we won't have any uh, personnel who are who are uh, explicitly uh, you know responsible for our, our parklands our open space and it's a lot of a lot of space we have I mean we do have in the water department but we so I just I just wanted to make that comment that it, you know this is I was worried that this was kind of you know potentially happen and you know the kind of dilution of the environmental uh, focus but also um, the potential uh, loss of those positions because they kind of are um, mm, the most vulnerable let's just say to, for cuts um, and so, so that being said I'm I'm just wondering if uh, it if we could get, and I, you know, I don't want to put a, a, a I want to have a return date, but I don't want to make it rigid because I would, I would like for us to be able to um, get an update on uh, from from you, uh, Chief Mills, and and perhaps others about how, what the impact has been, and you know, some kind of tracking of what we see happening as a result of this shift. Um, I think it's really important that we um, not just say this is what's going to happen um, because that's not necessarily what the public sees. You know, I, I think we want to be able to um, to be really clear about that. And I'd like uh, for and so I'm wondering if I could just request uh, getting a report back and and agendizing that for some point in the future that seems like a reasonable amount of time to see how this is going. Um, is that? Uh, is that of, of course, Council Member Brown, we'd be happy to, and I think it'd be important to have parks uh, and recreations and put on that as well, because they're the ones that see that a lot. I might just add two things to your concerns to maybe uh, assuage them a little bit. Um, one is there are still park maintenance workers uh, my understanding, and, and, uh, and Tony, you know, Director Elliott could probably refer to that. Uh, the second thing is, uh, we really, uh, our intent is to keep the rangers that we retain and now as CSOs in the parks, because we think that's an important place for them to be as part of the nature of this community. It's really a part of the vibrant lifestyle of this community to really cherish our parks, and so we really want to see that. If I might add, one of our um, employees just did a project in Arana Gulch where they cleared out a lot of people who were residing in Arana Gulch, went door to door, knocked on the doors, talked to the community members, and now they're discussing putting in a walkway so that there's natural surveillance for people. That is what we want to do. That's neighborhood policing, where we're working with the community rather than just responding to uh, you know, one call after another, we really want our CSOs and, our, and those folks that are working in the parks to be able to really take on some of these challenges, solve the problems for a little bit longer than what we have been doing. Right now, we've just been in crisis mode responding to things. So we're now, neighbor policing is expanding. They're doing a phenomenal job. They're having accountability briefings. And I think that's the way to go uh, so that we can actually solve some of these problems. We've also expanded the number of patrol officers uh, in neighborhood policing so that they too can provide assistance to uh, the uh, CSOs in those parks when as problems arise. Their duties are much more expansive, obviously, but we want to make sure that, uh, that they have the support uh, that they need uh, in those locations. Thank you. Yeah, and, and um, I don't know, um, Tony, if you want to say anything more on that, but I, and I recognize that there are parks maintenance workers. I mean, it's not like we're abandoning the whole system or anything, so I don't want to suggest that. I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm worried that, um, uh, you know, this, this, there could be gaps, um, you know, and, and so, I, and, you know, and in some respects, this is, this is a matter of, you know, perception as, uh, Council Member Matthews uh, mentioned before she uh, signed off. People are gen are really, uh, you know, rightfully concerned, and so and and so I just want to kind of make sure that we're really not um, we're not we're not taking this decision lightly. We've I think that's been clear, but that it's you know it's not something that we are going to just do and then you well know, you know check that off the list. It's it's done, and um, so yeah. So thank you for the. Uh, uh, Follow up, and um, I'll look forward to hearing how it's going. 
Um, I guess another concern I have, I'll just say this really quickly because now I'm looking in the bottom corner, there's Tony, um, <laughs> is, um, you know, when uh, we are in uh, budget, you know, when we have fiscal constraints that are, you know, you know, unforeseen and, you know, kind of of the magnitude that we're experiencing now, there will come a time when we are able to start restoring uh, some of those cuts. And I would, I would, you know, I would hope that we can, um, you know, keep this in, um, you know, in our, in the forefront of our minds that that's an important place to begin restoring um, services uh, when the time comes to be able to do that. So I'll leave it there. Tony, if you want to, I don't know if you were going to say something. But yeah, I just wanted to chime in and, and acknowledge and echo the chief's comments. I think when uh, you know, Parks and Recreation and the Police Department work really closely together and uh, meet uh, virtually every week uh, with our teams, I think where we work really collaboratively, we can develop specific plans. So the chief mentioned Arana Gulch uh, and having success there. I think that's a great example. Uh, Riverside Gardens is another example where the police department uh, has been able to, to sort of coach uh, parks, coach our park staff on what we can do differently or what we can do better. Uh, we learn from them, we can do things differently in terms of environmental design and whatnot. So I think regardless of, of um, you know, CSOs or rangers or whatever that structure looks like, I think the, the key is that continued collaboration. And we've seen a lot of success with that with the police department. Uh, and, and so again, whatever the council decides, I think related to the, the ranger, um, uh, proposal again that collaboration is going to be right at, at, at the top of the priority list and what I would say just quickly um, open space uh, we do have an open space team um, as well it's a small but mighty crew we've got a fuel crew leader a park maintenance worker and some temp staff uh, and then really about half uh, about 50 percent of one of our um, park supervisors spends his time uh, in the open spaces as well so we've got a small crew there but um, again, a, a strong crew. Overall, in terms of uh, park maintenance though, um, where we are currently, and we talked a little bit about the early retirements and, uh, and vacancies and so forth, park maintenance as a whole, uh, uh, 10 of our 35 positions are currently vacant. So that's where, again, I think as we talk about working with the police department, we're just gonna have to be really strategic and really, uh, really thoughtful about how um, our limited staff works with the police department most effectively. Um, but yeah, we've got almost a 30% vacancy among um, our park maintenance uh, crew at the moment. Thank you. I, you know, I had a follow-up question to um, Councilmember Brown's question and kind of this discussion around the roles of rangers um, versus maintenance workers. And so, I mean, it sounds like, you know, maybe traditionally decades ago, the, the rangers played a role of, you know, environmental ter interpretation and leading tours and things like that. And over time that's shifted to more of a public safety role in some regard because they're in these spaces. Um, and then you have maintenance workers who are kind of doing trails is that a correct kind of interpretation of the role of a ranger, you know, in the past, now, and kind of the difference between maintenance workers versus rangers? Because I'm just trying to wrap my head around and, you know, kind of to the comments that Councilmember Brown was saying, you know, it's, it's the, there's a desire, obviously, to have, you know, um, rangers in these open spaces, or, you know, if that role is going to now become a CSO, and the CSOs are going to be in these spaces, it seems like that rolls around public safety. And I just kind of wonder, you know, that role that someone used to play in these spaces in, with regards to, you know, interpretation around wildlife and, you know, conservation, who plays that role now? And is there, like, is there an opportunity maybe to consider moving forward for those kind of traditional ranger roles to come back in Parks and Rec if they're not there currently? Well, I think I can answer the first half of it, and I think maybe Director Elliott can handle the second half of it. And uh, we still currently do um, some interpretive walks and, and environmental uh, discussions with people who go with our rangers on walks. Uh, in addition to that, um, that, can, that will can and will still continue with the rangers that are turned into CSOs. So they can still handle those uh, duties and items. In addition to that, uh, those services can be augmented 
by a phenomenal staff that we have of um, volunteers. And I, you know, made note when uh, Councilmember Brown talked earlier about there's a whole lot of people who are interested in, in helping in the parks. And this is a great opportunity for people to engage and be part of our community-oriented policing and neighborhood-oriented policing efforts uh, to work with our CSOs and our in and, uh, and the parks and to uh, to do those kind of things that are vital to the health of a, of a community. In the second half of that, um, in terms of trail maintenance, uh, our staff, our uh, park maintenance staff get to uh, trail maintenance project as, as best we can. Um, really a lot of our trail maintenance um, is done through partnerships with local nonprofits like Mountain Bikers of Santa Cruz who do a lot of uh, obviously uh, maintenance on not just mountain biking trails but uh, hiking trails um, as well. So we work with a lot of nonprofits uh, to support uh, trail work that rangers uh, used to do. Um, and again, a lot of staff, as much staff time as we can allocate toward that with our park maintenance staff. Uh, in terms of interpretation, uh, again, a lot of partnerships there. So we work with uh, Coastal Watershed, we work with the uh, Museum of Natural History uh, under contract to do um, environmental education uh, and interpretation. So a lot of that is through partnerships with organizations uh, in the community. Great, thanks. I'll turn it over to Council, uh, council Member Byers. You're muted, Catherine. Thank you, Council Member Watkins. You asked the historic question, and I'm rather historic <laughs> on this subject because I've uh, Poganip from the founding of Poganip. In fact, I got a ticket on Poganip. They used to have a ranger on a horse, uh, the private security that the Cal Foundation hired. So I really have watched the rangers there or not there or private security or there or not there. And I think, um, of course, I did talk to um, um, Chief Mills about this, and I've always liked the title, community service officer. It seems there's a, so much more flexibility there. And I think you might use that word when I talk to you about it because I first thought, oh my gosh, we can't use the park, lose the park ranger. But I, I like the title and I think it gives uh, the department a lot of um, flexibility and what they'll do. Uh, and as you said, some of the park rangers will become that. So uh, the training will be um, important for sure when, as you hire new people, but I think you've so thought this out that you know exactly uh, what you're gonna be looking for because you're going to have an opportunity to hire new people too, I hope. So I'm I'm very concerned. Uh, I use the parks all the time. Thank you, um, Director Elliott, for all these people you have on West Cliff. We don't agree when they un when they took uh, uh, Supreme Court Ginsburg robe offer. They only left it on the statue for about 15 minutes and then they had to take it down. And so he and I had quite a discussion about that. I wanted to leave it up at least an hour, but he wouldn't do it. Uh, I'm so familiar with our parks and the work the Rangers do, but I, I think it, I'm, I'm willing to go something else. Let's try something else and see how it works. I like uh, Councilmember Brown idea. Let's, let's follow this up with reports. I think uh, it's something fairly new not entirely new, uh, but we should we should track it, and that's a really good suggestion. So, if whoever makes the motion, I put I'll assume they'll put that in the motion because I think it'll be really uh, the, the community is concerned. Uh, all the letters were alike. It was uh, I called a couple of friends I knew that signed some of them, and you know what the, the part they don't know is they're going to be replaced. There's going to be other people there, and some of them will be rangers. So I, I think as that as we, I don't want to use the word experiment, but as we go forward with this, we'll 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 check it, we'll keep track of it, and hopefully it, it goes well. So that's so. all. If I could just make a, a, a quick quick comment, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. Just one thing, just to kind of point out, just in general, just because uh, I think for the for the general public, I think it's good good to understand that. Uh, uh, in parks, we have, I think, like a 14% vacancy rate. Um, we have um, all the other departments that have pretty large vacancy rates, uh, uh, as well as uh, the, the, the furloughs that have been implemented. So 
We are, you know, and I think the public should just be aware, we are at, at a point where we've got uh, multiple factors that are really not allowing us to perform in the way that we are used to and that we actually expect. So it's very hard for us internally to, to accept this. I can tell you the department has struggled with this all the time. It's very difficult for them because they feel like they're not doing as good of a job as they really should be doing uh, and, and take it very, very personally. Uh, and the public also expects it, but it is very difficult, just for, quite frankly, from a, just a realistic perspective. The reality is that we simply, uh, even with these cuts, uh, don't uh, have the staffing levels that we've had because of the vacancies. And in some ways, the vacancies have kind of helped us avoid more layoffs than, than we have to. Um, uh, and, and so there's a way that it's, I guess it's been good. But, uh, and, and of course, we started those right away when we, we knew that we were going to be facing these cuts when the pandemic started back in, in March. Uh, but also, the, again, the furloughs, you know, where people are working less and have the ability to do that. So it, it is a real impact and uh, uh, it does, you know, make it, makes, it makes it really hard for us to be able to be as responsive as we really want to be. Great, thank you. Uh, we got Vice Mayor Myers, Council Member Golder, and then um, we don't have any further comments. We can probably then move on to um, public comment. So Vice Mayor Myers. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I just I just thought I'd kind of pile on to this discussion. Um, uh, and and I just recently also was in touch with um, the chair of the Parks Commission. Um, they took an action on Monday night that really points to the complexity of what's facing some of our park staff currently. And I've talked with uh, Director Elliott about this. Um, I think I think the community service. I, I almost see us having almost two different cases of need, um, and so this might be something to think about as maybe we do a little bit more of a deep dive um, in really looking at the right combination. Um, certainly, our urban parks um, have a certain set of needs, but but the folks who could service our open space. Um, parcels, you know, I think about people, I mean, I managed 8,500 acres um, working for a land trust, you know, and and the people that I hired to do that, you know, they look at the landscape with a slightly different eye than, you know, um, maybe that's someone that's not trained in resource management or other things. So, you know, we have about, I don't know, almost 2,000 acres of open space. We also have Loch Lomond. Um, I think increasingly we're understanding more and more with the fires this year and some of the impacts on the watersheds and, and on the, the habitat um, that is sort of this concept of more of a um, resource, natural resource man or ranger type of situation may be appropriate in parts of the city. Um, I think about Loch Lomond and the work that the rangers do there. Um, certainly they're focused on protecting the watershed resources, but they also do an excellent job of interpretation. They have wonderful tours that people can go out on the lake on. They're interpreting nature for folks. They're interpret interpreting the ecosystem and sensitive species. Um, we have all of that happening in our open space lands as well. And um, we have incredibly uh, delicate and endangered species located on those properties. So I see a little bit of you know, a separation of need and, um, you know, in the work moving forward and potentially in this, um, potentially maybe in the motion made, um, we can sort of direct staff to do a little bit of deeper dive and even really explore the differences of, of really the um, needs um, in versus our urban, our urban parks versus our open space lands. And maybe there's a, there's a spot there that we can start to grow towards um, I think it's also important, and there was a, there was an article in the Sentinel on this the other day. But um, uh, you know, I, w I would hope, and I, I see um, Chief Mills that there's some training going to be cut um, for potentially your staffing. But um, what really struck struck me in in the um, work that the Parks Commission did, um, which was pretty extensive, and they came out with some very interesting recommendations that I hope we can visit at some point. But this training about de-escalation, this training about how to to really how to handle some of the folks that are are uh, you know that our park staff come in contact with, and um, 
I guess question for the chief is, is making sure that those kinds of things are still available, would be made available through the CSOs. Um, and then um, I'm just curious about Director Elliott's thoughts on whether or not we sort of start to see a slightly different um, need for something that is more related to resource management rain, rain type of ranger or staffing versus um, urban parks. Just very brief if you guys have any uh, comments on, on um, these ideas. And um, thank you. I'll go ahead and go first, uh, 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 Vice Mayor uh, Myers. Um, the, uh, of course, the uh, the same things that we have addressed uh, with them in the past, de-escalation, uh, uh, how to intervene. Our CSOs, for instance, have also been trained in uh, crime prevention through environmental design. Those are some of the things that we can do uh, with now them being classified as rangers, give them additional training where they can go and help uh, take a look at parks, as you mentioned, with a different kind of eye. Now that they already have the ex parks experience, hopefully now giving the crime prevention experience, including situational crime prevention and SEPTED and some of those other things that we can absolutely bring that to the parks to make that environment safer uh, for the uh, park staff. And that certainly is an enormous concern uh, for us. It's abated a little bit because of COVID-19 since a lot of the structures have been closed, uh, like Loudon Nelson. However, it's still very important, and right now would be a great time to ramp that up, to give that training, to make sure that people have the opportunity uh, uh, to de-escalate the situations that may or may not arise in those locations. Uh, yeah, Vice Mayor Myers, this is uh, Tony Elliott. Um, just following up on the chief, yeah, I would uh, agree with his comments. And we have done uh, de-escalation training um, uh, quite a bit and continue to uh, you know be open to those opportunities and we really need those opportunities and we've even uh, we've talked with the Parks and Recreation Commission um, and have talked with uh, Santa Cruz County as well about even partnering up with um, mental health experts and folks that we could pair with in the field uh, to be better equipped in uh, engaging um, a number of individuals that we interact with on really on a daily basis so constantly seeking that training and partnerships and anything we can do. So I would just uh, echo the, the chief's comments there. Um, as it relates to the, the park system uh, overall, I would say that, as I mentioned, we've got a small but mighty open space team. Um, but as it relates to resource management and conservation, we really were not able to do a lot uh, in that area. Um, we do, what we do, we partner with the fire department so we've done some really good work at uh, uh, De La Viega this past year um, in terms of mitigating uh, some of the fire risk with shaded fuel breaks and so forth. Um, we need to do more of that, um, uh, but we've got a strong partnership there with the, the fire department and some funding uh, to do some of that. And then to some degree, we work with the, the water department as well, um, especially up near uh, Poganip and, and Sycamore Grove and, um, and so forth along the river, of course. Um, but that's an area where we could certainly do a lot more in terms of resource management, in terms of conservation. Um, it just don't don't have the resources necessarily to, to invest um, uh, uh, in that area necessarily. So I hope that answers your question, but uh, I'm happy to provide you more details. Okay, thank you. No, that's good. just good follow-up and, and um, thank you. Appreciate it. Councilmember Goldberg. So I have a couple of questions, um, and I'm not sure who to, who can answer this one. But one of them is, who does like the tra like the physical removal of the trash from, say, Poconip? Is that who does that? And <laughs> so that's not, so that's your department, and it's not Rangers that d that do that. That's maintenance workers. Correct. Right. Okay. okay. And then how many rangers were there? There's 12 now. How many were there when they were in the parks department? Uh, in parks and recreation, we, uh, I believe the max number we had uh, was 13 rangers. And then my, my last question is, um, if, if the, the rangers were still in your department, do you think that they would be in the same situation, like it would be a, 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 a possibility that would been, this, this would be having to be eliminated? 
right now? I know it's speculative, yeah. but. Yeah, I think generally, yeah. I mean, our mandate across the city is to, to cover these deficits, and we've got a couple years of that. So I think regardless of where the Rangers sat in terms of a department, the challenge would be the same. It would be to find those reductions. And um, I think we'd be facing the, the, same, the same conversation or situation as we are now. Thank you. All right. Are there any further questions or comments from council members at this time? Hearing none, I'd like to invite back uh, Councilmember Matthews. All right, so hearing no further comments, um, if members of the public would like to comment on any of the items that have been in our budget presentation for today, now is the time to call in using the numbers on your screen. Once you've called into meeting to the meeting, you'll need to press star nine on your phone. And once then when you've been asked to unmute, you'll have two minutes to comment. Okay, first caller. Thank you. This is Elise Casby calling in. I just want to point out that we have now been listening to you all talk for 125 minutes. So it's a long time. And if you are technological enough to have the tools to tune in, and if you are still interested in long and very difficult to understand uh, public processes, Maybe you're still with it, but I just want to say that um, I really think we need to open up our city council meetings to public participation in the civic auditorium. The budget is so important to our civic health and well-being, and it is so political. As we have seen uh, with the budget for the police departments across the country in relation to Black Lives Matter, that I really think that we should have some kind of public in-person participation. We can see our businesses have opened up partially, and of course we could use six to 10 feet of spacing being mandatory with masks, of course, because this is uh, crucial that we protect ourselves during this time of COVID-19. At the same time, our democracy is in crisis, it is crucial, especially in regards to public understanding of the budget, that we create a process throughout the year when the public is much, much more able to speak about what they see. Sorry, but you may have hit mute on your phone. Okay, I can see what you said. I accidentally pressed the button. I'm sorry. Can I continue on or what? What should I do? Uh, yeah, go okay. ahead. We'll give you about 30 more seconds. Okay. Anyway, I really believe that the public input and the public voice and presence is incredibly important here. We are also living in the time of the Screen New Deal when many people uh, who are in uh, the tech and computer industries, many of our robber barons of today, the CEOs and entrepreneurs would be more than happy to be controlling our government process and having us all getting on screens and being uh, reduced to very few minutes of actual public uh, free speech and so forth. So I just want to reiterate that if our businesses are open partially, certain, certainly our government should be open partially. We should be meeting, using protections, and we, sh we also need much, much more public participation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, 
next caller. Hi, this is Ann Simonton from the Commission for the Prevention of Violence Against Women. I'm very happy that you're going to continue with the victim advocate uh, position. And I'm uh, really looking forward to it not being interrupted with the CSO position. So I just wanted to thank you for making that accommodation. <clears throat> thank you all for your service. Bye. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Sarah Schofield. I am a licensed clinical social worker, and I'd like to provide you a little bit of history on your victim advocate position. 32 years ago in 1988, I worked for the Santa Cruz County DA's Office Victim Witness Program, and we received a grant to place a 24-hour emergency response victim advocate at Santa Cruz PD. I was that advocate. This led to the development of the current victim advocate position. I have continued to work with victims of violent crime ever since, mostly in the public sector. The Santa Cruz PD program advanced victim services to really state of the art over 30 years ago. And I'm respectfully asking you to reconsider taking these groundbreaking advancements backwards to an era where victims of violent crime, especially victims of domestic violence, were lost in the system. Please also consider the unintended consequence of actually creating more expense and more cost to the city. I know from direct experience that what outside agencies can provide does not approach the in-house services. Without this position, victims will resurface for additional calls for service and crises requiring police intervention that could otherwise be diverted. This position diverts events that are high risk for lethality outcomes, which would require extensive law enforcement resources. It's a life-saving position. I would like to respectfully suggest that you consider preserving this position and eliminating the CSO position that the duties would go to instead. I thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Welcome. Okay, next caller. Hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, good evening. Oh, good evening. My name is Olivia Martinez. I'm the Region 2 Director for SEA Local 521. And I'm a little bit concerned of what I'm hearing, that it sounds like you guys are going to go ahead and approve um, the budget that the city is proposing, and that means that you will be eliminating the Rangers program. Um, this is something that um, we've been moving a petition and email to you guys. And as you know, we've received over a thousand people uh, reviewing that Facebook and petition. And I'm concerned that the city council is not listening to its residents of the elimination of the Rangers program and the impacts that it will have in the community. Um, Chief Mills was the one that wanted the Rangers program two years ago to be moved from the parks to his department. And now he's eliminating this program with creating community and police officers that's actually more expensive than the Rangers program. Um, my, my true concern is that you are not listening to the public and you're making a decision based that you want to do an experiment to see if it works. And the livelihoods of 12 people is going to be impacted. I'm wondering what do we need to do as community members, because I also live in the city of Santa Cruz, for a city council to listen. If you've had so many people email to you, your constituents 
talk to you about what they want to see and you are refusing to look at that and say we're going to do this as an experiment when we have real issues in our parks and our levee that are happening that the rangers have so much experience the community officers do not have this experience or training that the rangers have or the relationship that community that they have with the community so i'm truly disappointed okay thank you okay next speaker Hello? Good evening. Uh, hi, my name's Adam Novak, uh, and I'm calling uh, to support the study session that is being planned on a, uh, a program that could provide an alternative at lower cost to sending police to intervene in situations where really there's more of a mental health or a social work uh, cause to why why people are are upset. Um, I've I've heard that there's uh, ongoing plans to to hold a study session on the on sort of adapting the cahoots program model here in Santa Cruz, uh, and I'm very supportive of this idea. And I'm eagerly awaiting uh, the scheduling information from City Council. Thank you. Honorable Mayor and Council Members, I thank you for your time. My name is Caitlin Bliskey and I'm a Ranger with the City of Santa Cruz under the Police Department. And I've been here through the transition from Parks and Recreation. It's been mentioned that the majority of the Rangers do not fit the typical Ranger ideals. However, my background is in plant pathology and family therapy with my family development credential. We have another Ranger who has a Master's in Marine Biology, a trail guide from State Parks, another with 15 years experience as a Park Ranger in separate municipalities, two EMTs who, were, who worked under Cal Fire in rural areas. The notion of replacing 13 positions, 12 rangers and one victim advocate with CSOs, whose focus is taking cold reports such as vandalism would have direct impacts to the services that are provided to our community. Although the term community service officer sounds generic enough to be able to be utilized for a multitude of different items, in reality, they serve as assistance to police officers to do work that they either don't feel they have the time to do or don't feel like executing. CSOs currently do not have the same input in-depth training of our parks and open spaces or the opportunity to gain that knowledge after they are off training due to being inundated with cold paper. A CSO could additionally not be currently relied on to provide the same services as a victim advocate to victims in a fragile state after some of them have experienced the unimaginable. Currently, we have been informed there's already a hiring list in place that wouldn't include 10 of our employees in the next hiring process. The quote transition process would in reality be a full hiring process, including interviews open to the public, not ensuring any jobs to the current employees slated to be eliminated. TSOs get paid approximately $3 more an hour starting this proposal that was branded as cost saving, although it's true impacts would be getting less for more. And although you have been ensured that they will be in the parks, you have already heard testimony that one has already planned to be moved to a victim advocate, advocate position that they are not prepared for. I urge you to vote against this proposal and further encourage you to explore the potential of moving park rangers back under parks and recreation and further allow us to continue to support the safety, security, and environmental preservation of the areas that make Santa Cruz unique. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, this is Charmaine Bueno de Vivo, and I want to discuss the Victim Advocate Program. Um, I want to express my grief regarding this matter, um, as I faced some of, I know this uh, program very intimately um, from Santa Clara County, even though it's a different county. Um, the, the program is important as it transcends monetary borders. Uh, my sister was murdered in San Jose in uh, 1999. Um, 
and it was very difficult for my family. Um, her body was burned beyond recognition, so it was very hard for um, my parents to have to identify her remains. Um, having an advocate means having someone professionally who knows how to help them with the roller coaster of emotions that occur in this time of desperation. And desperation it was for my family. My mother's connection to the advocate helped anticipate the family's needs. Um, she was able, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. She was able to communicate, the advocate was there to communicate um, all the information that our family needed and allow the detective to continue to focus on the case. Currently, um, I feel that mental health programs are especially important at this time. Um, and this program is, a mental, is for mental health support. Our world is suffering emotionally with the lack of the ability to have physical connection with each other. The more love and support and compassion that we can, can, we can offer, the less we face, uh, we suffer. Um, and this program is just offered a temporary rock when the core of our family unit had dissipated. Removing a program like this, I believe, would be detrimental to the families and ultimately to our community. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor, Vice Mayor. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Anna Henderson and I'm calling in, um, well, partially because I'm still confused after listening to y'all talk about it for half an hour as to what the difference in job expectations and in training is between a park ranger under the police department and a community service officer under the police department and why one costs half of us as, as much as the other one but is presumably going to do just as much work. Um, that was not made clear by the meeting at all and I would appreciate it if you guys could define community service officer a little more clearly. Um, and then I also wanted to um, support um, the investigation of a cahoots model as a way to divert um, um, emergency response from police to a lower cost model that doesn't send law enforcement out but instead sends non-law enforcement, mental health, and medical professionals out directly um, and could potentially save the city money while also giving people what they need. Um, and it sounds like from what Martine Bernal said, this might be in the works with the county and I just encourage the city to move forward with that at all speed and let us know soon when you'll be talking about that next. Thank you. Thank you. So for those people who are tuning in, if you'd like to call in to comment on the budget, um, now is the time to call in on this item. And once you have called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, you'll be given a cue to unmute your phone. And when you've been unmuted, you'll be given two minutes to speak. So again, if you would like to comment on this item and you've called in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Uh, and you'll be given two minutes when it's your time to speak. Next caller, uh, please unmute. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kimberly Johnson. I'm an internal organizer with SDIU 521. Uh, I just want to repeat and voice our, our, our really deep concerns with the police department's proposal to eliminate the Park Services Ranger Program. Our rangers provide really incredibly crucial support to the Santa Cruz community, and um, like others have voiced, I, I don't believe that the established and unique relationships that the rangers have with the community can be replaced by community services service officers, um, but you know, during a time when our country is really searching for creative ways to move away from policing as a means to keep us safe, I think it would be a real mistake for the city, for the county, um, 
to lay off rangers and in turn hire more officers. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, our 11 rangers have incredibly valuable backgrounds and play a really special role in maintaining our parks and open spaces. And I would really like to urge um, city council members not to approve the elimination of the Park Services Ranger Program. Thank you. Good evening. Hello. You're on the line. Uh, my name is Daniel Hedman. I'm a recent homeowner here in Santa Cruz. Just bought a town. I'm here after 15 years of living in an apartment downtown. I'm on the edge of the city uh, next to a big open space. This is a critical concern for me. Um, I can tell you that the CSOs are part of a different union. They're not part of the SEIU. They have a bigger uh, liability in terms of retirement benefits, et cetera, et cetera. So I think in the long term, you're going to wind up costing a lot more money to have CSOs replace rangers. Second of all, the rangers within the Parks and Recreation Department were dealing with things of uh, resource management, park infrastructure function. CSOs are not geared to handle those type of nature management duties. Uh, typically, they don't even sign up for that kind of service. Uh, they also don't wear uniforms and identify themselves as rangers or open space enforcers. California Penal Code says that a park ranger in a city recreation department or water department is considered a peace officer. When they're under parks and rec, they have a law enforcement arm of their own. Now they're gone. They went to the police department. Now there's no enforcement structure for the recreation director to utilize to deal with park issues. And we know there are plenty of them, open space issues, whether they be chop shops, drug use, debris everywhere, whatever it is. I mean, the land the space acreage is much larger outside the city limit, you know, in, uh, sorry. The open spaces are much larger than the central uh, concentrated city areas that we know and use every day. So we're going to be very sparse with people um, enforcing those areas. And I'm a little concerned that uh, right here where I live, you have the entire watershed of the San Lorenzo River just being infiltrated uh, with debris and, and ecological devastation when it comes to the natural habitat, the, the animals. I'm opposed to this. Thank you. Hello? Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Candace Brown. Um, I'm a commissioner with the Transportation and Public Works. Um, I, in the middle of a pandemic, and when public health and safety are of ultimate concern to our community, we introduced the idea of the Slow Street Program at the commission level. Uh, we proposed a working with a community partner to offload the staff time and also to tap into a large volunteer pool. We received resistance from staff who decided to do this internally without any further involvement of the commission. The signs that they chose were too big for the A-frames. They did not even mention the word slow or slow street. Um, there was no outreach to the neighbors or even the streets that the signs and A-frames were on. So people were confused that they could even get to their own homes. So naturally there was a lot of um, confusion so there was a discussion about that at this last commission, and they said they would step back and, and look at this further. At this meeting today, basically, the director said he would like to eliminate the Slow Street program. The community partner that we worked with, Bike Santa Cruz, has taken the proposal that we work with them on that we, the city proposed through the commission, and they've now gone on to implement this through the county and through Watsonville using um, RTC funds, which is a reallocation from open streets, which has been a very clever allocation. We could have done the same, and instead we have lost out. Um, there's almost 50 applications, of which 11 were part of phase one. We fully expected this to go to fuller implementation. 
I invite you to reconsider the idea that Mike, that Mike Santa Cruz is willing to step up. They have a small allocation that could take over at least the administration of the existing program. You'll find that their signage and other information through an infographic that they are proposing for the county in Watsonville is very inventive. They've also in Watsonville are sponsoring through endorsement through business and community the cost of the program. So please reconsider and fully embrace the Slow Street program, especially in the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greetings. Hi, Santa Cruz City Council. My name is Emily Mile, and I want to, um, the victim's advocate position, I would like to stress on why it is so important, especially in a small local community like ours. So, my sister-in-law, Morgana Dowd, was murdered by her husband in the family home with the children present Labor Day 2007. I don't know what the family would have done without Julie Schneider and Butch Baker's endless work on this case. This was a high profile case with a huge media onslaught in my hometown of Santa Cruz. The perpetrator happened to be the Harbor High lacrosse coach which added to the public interest. Growing up in a small community like Santa Cruz has many wonderful benefits, but the public attention this case gained was unbearable for the family. Julie Schneider's role is to comfort and get information to the family as a victim's advocate and to keep them current of all proceedings and developments to make sure they know that they do not have to navigate this alone in an unfamiliar arena. This extends way beyond the trial. Julie immediately made us comfortable that we could ask her anything and we did. At first, it was the standard case information and case developments. The perpetrator had committed the crime, intercepted his 13-year-old son that was checking on mom and left for two days not to be found for a while. He never admitted to the crime, forcing his young son to take the stand and testify against dad. The court case took over a year, complete with graphic descriptions, post-mortem pictures, and having to look at the murder. Had this case been more straightforward with a confession on site, this would have been easier and a quicker process. Julie was there the entire time at every hearing coming to the home available at any hour for a phone call, and we are still friends to this day. I do not know what we would have done without her. Her knowledge of cases in Santa Cruz, having been, uh, having lived here for so long and being such a wonderful person made all the difference. Chief Mills, this is very important that you have a local person doing this. My ex-husband, whose sister this was, and myself, no, police, uh, Fire Chief Haidu, we went to school with him. He can tell you how much of a tight lit community this is. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Okay, next caller. Yeah, hi, this is Gary Phillip. Hey, I didn't really prepare anything for this, but uh, you know, I, I would just uh, indicate that uh, I spent a lot of time in the parks and uh, you know, like say, let's just say Grant Park with at the dog park. And uh, I see rangers there all the time. I mean, almost every time I go there, it seems like they show up. And uh, there's a lot of uh, homeless people there that hang out. And I can't really say that uh, you have had any uh, untoward encounters with them, but it's a little sketchy there. And you know, you always got the bathrooms closed and locked up and got the water turned off and got the, the dog water turned off. And um, they have encounters with the homeless, they talk to them. And uh, I don't know, uh, it just seems like if the rangers sort of disappeared, you know, I don't know if that situation wouldn't uh, somehow, you know, get worse. Uh, so I, I'm just concerned about that. And um, uh, I would say that uh, I, I know this is out of left field, but I still think you can eliminate the climate action manager position and any associated positions, and it would make no difference at this time. I mean, climate is going to do what it's going to do. and. Uh, it seems like that position is reacting to climate, and uh, we can react when it changes, uh, you know, as effectively as as what they're doing, which is just waiting for it to change, you know. So that's all I have to say. Bye. Thank you. 
Okay, um, so this is your last opportunity. If you'd like to comment on this item, now is the time to call in. Once you call in, please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when you are asked, after you've been asked to unmute, you will have two minutes to speak to council on items related to the budget. Uh, it seems like the uh, police department is playing the shell game with the Rangers' positions, and it's, it's not really clear if they're saving any money. And then the victim's advocate, they're uh, pawning off to the district attorney's office and without any, like, inference as to whether or not this is going to be an actual victim's advocate or just a advocate for people that are actually within the court system. Um, I think you need to retain that victim's advocate position because um, not everything's going to go to court. Some things just fall between the cracks and don't end up being prosecuted or whatever, and people still need advocacy and uh, help being guided to where they need to find help. Um, it seems like there's a no number of other instances within this budget where there's a the shell game being played. Uh, I would suggest that the city hire a forensic accountant to go through the budget of every department and find every hidden dime and nickel that there is so that we can have a real look at where we stand. Um, in the meantime, maybe we should ad adopt the budget from 1972 or something to hold us through until we uh, know exactly what's going on here. Um, there seems to be a, 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 <clears throat> an instance here where each department wants to like, you know, save what little they can or as much as possible of what they're doing even though you know you go by and see people working and one guy will be working and we have eight guys standing around him and it's the same way the police um hippie on the mall smoking a joint 10 castles i mean it's kind of ridiculous comments from members of the public. I'm going to bring it back to council for action deliberation. Um, before a motion is made, I wanted to maybe um, um, just ask that um, in order to kind of keep this clean, I have a suggestion for the motions, which is that if there are council members who are interested in making an adjustment to the budget or recommendation for an adjustment, that we maybe pull that department out and then make um, motions on departments that we don't have any issues with. So for example, um, if there's um, no changes to be made to, for example, finance, IT, HR, public works, that we can move the budgets that we um, maybe don't have any um, issues or comments with, and if there's a department where we want to make any changes or recommendations for changes, that we um, pull those departments out and we can have further discussion about those budgets. So I'm wondering if there's any feedback or people think that might be a good approach. A thumbs up from Councilman Brown, Councilman Block, and it seems like there's consensus around that being a good approach. Good. Okay. Uh, Councilman Watkins. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for clarifying that. That was kind of my question on how you wanted procedurally to go through this. Um, and then I, I'm assuming that Councilmember Matthews at some, at some point will have to recuse herself. Mm -hmm. So I, um, I guess I'll just make a few comments, but I appreciate the input from uh, our staff and the call. Um, having served on the Committee for the Prevention of Violence Against Women, I know um, just how valuable our victim's advocate position is. And so at this time, I really don't feel comfortable eliminating that position. I don't know if you want to have that as a standalone as we go through the police budget, 
But um, in order to move things forward, I'm happy to just sort of go through the various uh, departments to try to get um, where consensus is on their budgets, and then we could set aside. Okay. So, so I think. Go ahead. So if I, if I may, then what we can do is um, let's pull the police budget. And I think we need to discuss that independently as well, given the conflict of interest with Councilmember Matthews. So I'll pull that one aside. And then Councilmember Watkins, if you have any other ones that you'd like to pull out, then we can do that. And I can just kind of go through. Um, and uh, if one hasn't been pulled, then uh, we can pull that one in. But if, it's, if there's alignment, then similar to kind of how we do um, commission appointments, um, we can move forward. So. Are there any other departments that you have um, questions or suggestions for cuts or um, changes? Not not at this time. I, I didn't know if we wanted to have any further discussion. I know that Councilmember Brown mentioned she had comments in regards to the city managers. Mm -hmm. um, so we could pull that one the, for the purposes of those discussions to ensue. But other than that, in the police, um, I'm happy to move the other department's uh, budget. Okay. I'll come back to you just in case there's um, any other departments that need to be pulled. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. I was just going to ask uh, that we pull the city manager's uh, department's budget. So uh, thank you, Council Member Watkins. Okay. Council Member Matthews. Oh, you're muted. As I understand it, the motion's been made now to adopt the budget with the exceptions of the police department budget and pulling city manager's budget. I think, oh. uh, am, am I correct on that? I think the, I, my plan was to go through it. That, that's where we're headed. I think what I was going to go through first is seeing if we needed to pull any other departments and then once we um, had consensus on which departments we wanted to discuss in detail, um, I think Councilmember Watkins was ready to make a motion, but I was going to wait until we... Um, okay, I, I guess another oh. approach would be to do first start with a blanket motion to adopt everything except for the police department budget and then suggest maybe amendments to that. I'm, I don't know what others are thinking for city manager. My only interest in that budget is adding in the city county task force. So if there are other things, maybe that can be done simply without I think, it pulling the whole. I think it was, I think that that's what I'm trying to get to to make it simple is okay. to by pulling these okay. things. <laughs> Councilmember Golder. I wanted to talk about Parks and Rec, about the uh, museum. I don't know if we need to pull that or not. Okay, well, if you have a comment or, you know, I don't know if you have it was, a suggestion. The suggestion would be that not closing it. <laughs> so I don't know how. <laughs> we'll pull that. We'll pull that. We'll pull yeah. <laughs> Okay, are there any other departments that council members would like to make budget changes to? Okay, hearing none. Um, so what we need right now is a motion to pass uh, the budgets for finance, IT, HR, public works, fire, economic development, and planning. It's Councilman Watkins. I'm happy to make that motion. Okay, I'll second that. And so we'll go to the uh, city clerk to do a roll call vote on this first item and then we'll return back to those other departments. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. So those departments, the recommendations for those departments pass unanimously. And so now um, let's start with- Mayor? Yeah, oh yeah. Mayor, 
Is it possible to take a five minute break? I really yeah. need to go to the restroom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll take a five minute break. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Once council members are back, if you could uh, turn your videos on so that we know that you're here, we can go ahead and continue on with our meeting. I think we're just waiting on uh, Council Member Watkins to come back, and then we can get started. Great, looks like we're all back. So I think um, what might be the best way to get to go through this is we can start with city manager's office, move into parks and rec, and then we can move into police. We, we, when we move on to the item of police, we can start with the victim's advocate and any other changes that need to be made uh, with the exception of the park rangers. And then if there's further discussion about the park rangers, uh, we can then um, have the discussion around that item as well. Sound good? Okay. So, um, Council Member Brown, let's, um, I'll turn it over to you to hear your, your comments on the city manager's budget. Yeah, thank you, Mayor Cummings. So, I think it was our uh, assistant city manager, Laura Schmidt, who uh, mentioned that we there was some uh, difference of, in perspective on what to do with the community programs. Uh, budget, which is in the city manager's and um, I expressed uh, uh, serious concerns about it. Um, it is, uh, an, it is a, you know, the I, I, I continue to say this: that not all cuts are equal, and uh, you know, I'm 
overall, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not entirely thrilled about the decisions that we came to. Um, I mean, I think we did a really good job as the budget committee, and so I want to thank um, Vice Mayor Myers and um, Mayor Cummings for that and staff for kind of helping us through that. But I believe that there are other places in the budget that where we could uh, find money to ensure that the community programs that really rely on this funding, that were granted this funding, and while it hasn't been distributed, we're not asking for them to give it back. It was part of the core uh, funding allocations that were made. Those were multi-year uh, agreements. And uh, to, for those uh, community programs to be cut, some of them, I mean, it's, it's like, you know, a $500 cut or something, you know, and, and but it makes a tremendous difference to those programs. And I think particularly during a time when uh, we are in crisis and we are relying on, uh, you know, a lot, you know, the, these community programs are getting a lot, they have a lot more pressure and a lot more need for those services um, that I, I'm just not willing to support cutting those programs. And so I'm, um, I'm going to ask uh, my colleagues to consider restoring those uh, cuts and directing the staff to find other uh, places to um, to cut the budget. I mean, we are we have you know a 265000 dollars to go, which still hasn't been um, is not here before us today. So I think that. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm just not going to support those cuts. So I wanted to make that clear. And when the time comes for motion making, um, I'll just, um, you know, make that as a uh, uh, amendment, um, uh, you know, amended motion or, uh, you know, an amendment and see where it goes. But I just wanted to be really clear about that before we uh, continue the conversation. I'm also very supportive of uh, including the CSC advocate, I think that was not, um, I think that the budget committee was, was pretty uh, aligned on that one, um, but we were not on uh, community programs. So um, that, I just wanted to be clear that's not my position. Well, I'll just mention that, um, I'll say I'm, I'm also a bit concerned about that. I know that Council Member Brown had asked for during our meetings if there's a way that we could find adjustments and then um, we didn't have those when it came back so um, I just want to honor her concern and, we, and Sandy I think what um, if you want and what I was thinking is that we could go through each department so if you want to make a motion on this right now now is an appropriate time but I was thinking that we could go through each department so um, unless there's further discussion or but I'll give you the floor if you'd like to make a motion on this um, so I would move, I don't have the um, line items in front of me, I'm sorry, uh, I could be more specific, but I, I so yeah, I would, I would move that we adopt the city manager's uh, proposed budget uh, with the uh, addition of $20,000 for the UCSC advocate position extension and uh, with removing the uh, cuts to community programs uh, funding, um, and I'm, I, I'm, I'll pull it up so I can try to clarify this, but there is $40,000 of that or 45,000 of the 150 plus uh, of, in that budget was for a set-aside fund. And because those funds weren't allocated and we haven't had a process, I'm, I'm okay with, um, you know, that cut, but uh, the other 100 and, uh, approximately 15,000, I think, um, I'm, I'm not going to support. So um, the motion is to um, add the UCSC advocate and to uh, remove cuts to the core, the community program's core funding. Okay. Motion by Councilmember Brown. I'll go ahead and second that motion. And Councilmember Brown, what I see there's on page uh, 38, attachment three, there's community programs set aside 45,000, community programs core 87,975, community programs and services uh, to reduce hopes programs, um, reduce contract to the county by 10%, 19,800. Is it the latter two or just the 87,000 to be specific? Thank you, the core funding uh, so 80, yeah. 87,975. Sorry, I wasn't prepared to start making motions yet, so I didn't have that um, line item pulled up. But thank you. Yes, that's the that's my um, motion. Okay. Uh, I see Council Members 
Bruce Watkins. Uh, well, I'll let the city manager comment first, but then Councilmember Watkins, Byers, and Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to provide one clarification. I, I think we uh, uh, didn't mention with respect to uh, community programs. One of the things that the, the city uh, is receiving uh, this year because of the uh, as part of the federal CARES because of the pandemic and because uh, of the uh, federal CARES funding is uh, direct CDBG CARES excuse me CDBG CARES funding, which is federal funding. Uh, that is part of our CDBG program that's additional to what we normally receive. Uh, we expect to receive about another half million uh, in the next couple of months, uh, which can be allocated uh, to community programs. There are restrictions uh, with respect to how it can be used because it does have to be used for COVID-related responses. But uh, what staff would be recommending, uh, and that'll be before you because you have to approve the allocation for that uh, funding, uh, although it'll come uh, to you next month or so, but we would recommend that, uh, similarly to what the county did, is uh, to uh, offset the 8.5% uh, recommended reduction in community programs by uh, setting aside a portion of that funding towards community programs. Now, to be clear, it's not a one-for-one -one, uh, substitute. Yeah, because they have to meet certain criteria, but it would provide for an opportunity for community programs organizations to uh, try to offset the, the impact. That is essentially what the county has done, although they've uh, uh, implemented a 10% reduction for their community programs, as I understand. So I just wanted to clarify that and provide that additional information that the, there is a recommendation to try to uh, uh, offset the impact to some extent by providing some of the federal CARES funding to community programs. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Watkins. Um, no, thank, thank you. I think that's really important information. I too kind of had concerns about cutting some of these really safety net services that are critical, especially for those that are most vulnerable right now, and was thinking of an, a, maybe an alternative or maybe an, kind of a component of this could be to um, have some portion be set aside so that those essential services that may need additional funding that aren't um, that are impacted by the potential uh, decrease of core funding to be able to access that bridge amount. So, for example, if there's a program that um, it, you know state food food, uh, food insecurity or childcare or whatever it may be that they could potentially use uh, set aside funding to kind of bridge that potential decrease amount, but maybe it could be a combination now learning that the CARES funding could be used to um, backfill some of the core dollars, that it could be a combination of an action that would include um, drawing in some of the CARES dollars, but also setting aside a portion of funding so that we're able to bridge the immediate needs and the essential safety net services or something to that extent. I don't know if Martin, you want to elaborate on what. Yeah, you're yeah. Saying. I think what what the, what staff is recommending is that a fund uh, set aside, essentially, of the equivalent, essentially the equivalent reduction, be set aside, uh, so that the community programs can access uh, funding for the things that you mentioned, uh, food insecurity. That's actually the this year's round. Of, we also received this year a round of uh, in the current budget a round of CARES Act. Uh, CDBG, and that was principally allocated to food insecurity, senior programs. Uh, it could also go to child care programs. Uh, those you just have to uh, has to be focused on uh, pandemic response, uh, which all of those things qualify for. So that would be the idea again to try to focus, uh, essentially create our, a, a separate set aside uh, with uh, those sort of conditions uh, or restrictions compliant with the CARES Act requirements. Um, which largely do fall uh, on, in those categories. This year, we prim primarily funded, uh, you may recall, the food bank, uh, community bridges, and, and their various programs for seniors and daycare uh, are examples. So if I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly, I, I guess what I'm hearing you say is that you, we, your recommendation is that we move forward with the proposal to have the 8.5% reduction but to then also at the same time create the separate funding for 
applicants that may have been impacted by that reduction or others, I guess, is to access those CARES dollars to provide the essential services. Does that sound, does that accurately cover what yes, you said? Yes, yes, that, that's exactly right. Okay, thank you. Yep, Vice Mayor Myers. Uh, most of my, I, I had some similar questions um, and just wanted to clarify um, at the close of our last, um, I, I had to leave a little early from the budget committee, but I'm, I spoke with the city manager today and with um, the county folks. Uh, and, and so I'm glad to see that we can, we can potentially make this work with some of that CARES funding. So thank you for looking into that and uh, Happy to hear that, so that that support can continue for our for our community nonprofits. Thanks, uh, Councilmember Brown. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. My motion stands. I have uh, three points I want to make on this. One, uh, since we've been talking about his, historical uh, context. Uh, the community programs budget has been cut from almost $3 million to a million dollars over the past two decades. Um, and we have asked for, you know, increased, uh, you know, application, you know, hoops to jump through for, for applications and for reporting purposes. Um, so that's one. Two, the administrative cost for determining you know, exactly where, which programs, one, the cuts, right? And then two, which of the programs might, we might be able to fit into this other category, um, pr most likely a process being set up that is gonna require uh, uh, nonprofits to apply for that funding. So, um, so on the administrative cost to the city for doing that for such a small amount of money seems, um, it just doesn't seem necessary to me. Um, and that kind of gets, I'm just going to now go back around to one of my earlier comments, that this kind of gets at my big concerns about the administrative kind of consultant heavy approach that we take to this kind of funding. Um, we could just leave it in place and, you know, take one consultant contract for, you know, that produces a PowerPoint for us and just leave it be. So the, that third uh, concern is the burden on nonprofits to be able to, um, you know, for, to try to restore, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars in some cases. These very small nonprofits that um, do provide critical services, and the determinations about what's essential and what is food essential, is childcare essential, are you know, senior service, you know, what is, you know, I mean, there's all all kinds of things to be considered essential, and I would argue that they all are. So you know, I'm not gonna. Um, withdraw my motion, my motion stands, and um, if others want to uh, come up with an alternative uh, after the vote, um, if that's necessary, then we'll, we can do that. But I mean, I just think this is, this is just kind of a, a ridiculous thing to be nitpicking about um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. So I'll leave it there. Okay. Councilmember Matthews and Councilmember Byers. I think I'm agreeing with Councilmember Brown, but I just want to get clear with it. So my understanding is we anticipate with a reasonable degree of certainty that we're going to get some CARES funding within the, the relatively near future in the amount of several hundred thousand dollars. Is that a correct statement? I guess that's for the city manager. Yes, yes. Our allocation is going to be approximately, actually it's approximately uh, half a million. Um, okay. So I really uh, support the motion, if this is what it is, of um, not making the cut with specific direction that the um, amount of that cut be backfilled to the maximum degree possible with the anticipated CARES funding, period. I don't support giving any further direction on the CARES funding because we have a bazillion CARES-related um, issues to face. So when we get that money, then that's a longer discussion. Have I understood it correctly? That's a question. <laughs> yeah, I, so I, yeah, I was waiting to be called upon. Uh, yes, yeah. so I you know, didn't provide that um, additional uh, clarifi clarifying direction, but yes, that is the thinking that um, to the extent possible, uh, the um, the 
that amount could be backfilled for the organizations that are eligible uh, for CARES Act funding. Um, yes. Okay. Councilmember Byers. And you're muted, Catherine. Um, yes, um, Council Member Matthews brought up what I was going to bring up, so uh, I'm ready to support the motion, understanding that the, the CARES money will backfill and make it whole, make everyone whole. Can I just pause? Okay, I just want to clarify that. Okay. Uh, Council Member Watkins. I just wanted to um, get clarification, uh, Martin. When did you say that this, you expect these dollars to come in for the CARES funding? Because this is new information for us tonight. Uh, I was just uh, checking with Bonnie. Um, I believe that they've given us a notification already of the amount that were received, uh, which is approximately half a million dollars. The council, it has to go to council approval. So we need to schedule it onto the council. And so we should be getting it in the next couple of months. It'll be this fiscal year. Uh, and you will take further action at the council to uh, allocate the funding. So it still has to come back to you. So I think uh, like I said, the recommendation was to uh, uh, right, have that those funds be allocated for those purposes, but you would have to make that decision when it comes back to you. Um, I'll see if, uh, I don't know if uh, Bonnie, is the uh, Urbano from can, can add to, to that. Uh. No problem. I guess I'll just for maybe clarification say um, I think hope to get the services, uh, the essential services covered in terms of the safety net providers, but um, also recognizing that there's other essential services that have been drawn on more so than others, and how are we ensuring that they're able to access those dollars? And if I'm hearing you correctly, Martine, I, I heard that there's certain services that won't qualify for the CARES dollars. Is that accurate? Uh, exactly. The, the uh, uh, as I understand, the, it has to be COVID-related, uh, although many uh, nonprofits, uh, and I happen to know some of this because I serve on several boards uh, of, of uh, nonprofits, are doing quite a bit of additional COVID-related response, such as Second Harvest Food Bank, Community Bridges. So uh, there is that uh, uh, ability to, to, to make that case for many organizations, but there would be others that would not, I, I would uh, suspect, I don't know for sure. So we can't promise that it will be a one for one, uh, you know, offset for every single organization uh, as well. And uh, a director that comes on, on here and I think can, can further clarify. Thank you. Yes, just to clarify a little further, the, the funding specifically from CDBG for CARES Act is specifically COVID-related, and there are requirements that it must not be replacing general fund dollars. So we, in order to do that, we need to make sure that each of these organizations, if they're applying and, want, and to be eligible for the funding, that they are providing specific um, care and services related to COVID. And I think that most of these organizations are doing that, so uh, hopefully most of them would be eligible. I will say, though, I'm not sure how many of these organizations would apply. We do have a limit um, to the number of organizations that we can fund with the CDBG funding. Um, there are some minimum uh, amounts that we can award due to the um, amount of reporting that has to be done by each agency. Um, it, it's definitely one of those um, funding sources um, for CDBG where the reporting is quite intensive. So it, it's just a consideration um, for those organizations. So some of the uh, more established organizations that have received CDBG funding in the past will not have any problem whatsoever. So community bridges, um, you know, as, as the city manager mentioned, as well as Second Harvest Food Bank and some of the organizations that are already submitted for either the first CDBG round or even the second round under the CARES Act it will be an easy um, application process for them, but some of the other organizations with, that receive smaller amounts from the city might have some challenges with this type of funding. Okay, no, I, I appreciate that. So it sounds like um, there will be some application sort of, or uh, some sort of formal request to get those dollars to go 
towards their programming one way or another if it goes with the CARES Act. I mean, I'm not a big fan of bureaucratic structures, and I think we want to leverage these dollars as best as we can. I know that a lot of organizations are, especially the nonprofits, do sort of struggle with some of the um, technical resources, so how to support them versus the others that could right. potentially. Right. Yeah, yeah, we'd want to do it in a, as expedited and as easy as this process as possible, really, because we want to get the dollars out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Thank you. Councilmember Matthews and then Councilmember Golder. Um, this just complicates what I thought the situation was. I thought we um, do not make the, the recommended cut. We cover that. When we get to CDBG, we can, we can do some analysis of which routes in which services are doing COVID related and do that transfer back. It sounds now like we have to do a whole big application for each of those backfills. Do you want to just clarify what it is we're doing here? I'm, and this is just so I know I prefer the simpler, but if the simpler isn't possible. <laughs> I don't know who that question goes to. Yeah, I, uh, uh, this is the first, I'm sorry, I'm thinking, thinking this through the first I've heard of the, this approach because what we, I think what you're suggesting, Councilmember Brown, is to go ahead and uh, uh, I, I suppose we can work with it. If, if the idea is we won't disperse the funds until we kind of work out who's eligible and who's not and then, and then disperse them at that point where we know where there's that uh, difference. I guess that's what we'd have to do, come up with a process like that uh, versus uh, everybody getting cuts and then people applying and making it up as they go through the process. I think that's the distinction that uh, you're making from a process perspective. Um, and I, I think we can I think we can make that work. Um, just can quickly check in with, uh, with, with Bonnie on that. Councilmember Brown, I'll, I'll allow you to maybe reply if you well, yeah, I, I, the the my my uh, intention here is to uh, to not make the cuts today to those programs, and then um, of that eighty seven thousand um, dollars, there will be organ you know there um, and among our list of organizations that get funded, there will be some that um, can apply for those funds. It. I'm sure there are creative ways. I mean, you guys figure out all kinds of ways to do creative <laughs> accounting and um, uh, fund balancing. So, uh, you know, I, I just want to, so with the expectation that the CARES Act funding will go to, um, you know, help with the cost of the community programs funding that we, and also augment it because it's more than $87,000 available to us. So that's, you know, I mean, how, with you know so i guess that's my the, my intention and so the motion was to just not uh, to to withdraw those cuts and um with the expectation that cares act funding will um, help support some of those programs and i think if we say it that way gen kind of generally um it doesn't you know technically mean that we are um back you know we're using uh cares act funding to uh, perform, you know, uh, general fund functions. I, that's my, you know, just my, the way I, my sense of it, and correct me if I'm wrong. Right. I think that the only, the only consideration or, or thought is that that would not, as I understand it, would not result in any savings to the general fund, uh, which is, again, the purpose of, of making the reductions. But obviously that's up to the city council. Do you want to you have a follow up I, to that? I'm just having a hard time understanding how it, if the if CARES Act funding, so if we take $87,000 distributed across the 60 or so organizations that we um, we fund, um, and we say we're not going to make those cuts at this time, and then we're going to when we get CARES Act funding figure out you know who gets what as part of that. I, I don't understand how that that wouldn't be. Um, you know, helping with the general fund. 
So if you're suggesting that once we figure out how it's allocated and then we offset that, the, somehow then reduce their budgets by those amounts that we figured out, then that would, but I, I wasn't clear whether you had mm -hmm. said that was okay. I, I kind of understood you to say, let's not fund them and then addition, provide funding from CARES. Uh, if you're saying, no, let's fund them, but once we figure out who's eligible and what they can receive, then we offset that, then then that would result, if that's what you're saying. I'm just, that, if, that if, is, that's, if that's what that, you're saying, yeah, it would. That is what I'm saying, and I believe that okay. was the language that council okay. members used uh, okay. just to be at. Okay, so then that's, part, and that's what, and I think that's, early, uh, then yes, we can we can try to make that work if that's, if, if that's what you're saying, yeah. I'm writing, taking some notes, because I think when we come back from the motion, we need to make sure that it's clear. Um, Council Member Golder. So I'm not trying to beat a dead horse here, but I think I might be the only one in the group that has zero experience with nonprofits. Obviously, I've encountered some of these in my professional capacity, but I'm not on any boards. I do not know how they work, so maybe someone can enlighten me. So. For the funding they get, I'm assuming it's coming from a number of sources because they're not operating off this minuscule budget. Um, is there anything in the safety net of the fallout of COVID that um, from the federal or state government that allows nonprofits to apply for funds directly from the federal or the state government for funds that maybe have been impacted due to um, the situation? Uh, yes, yes, there are. Um, again, serving on the board of directors, I know that for sure. There are multiple sources available the, from the county and directly from the state for uh, CARES uh, COVID impacts. Uh, now, it depends on, on what the organizations are, are doing. So it's, uh, it's not every single organization, um, uh, but uh, because of the pandemic, uh, 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 there have been allocations given that are directly to nonprofits from other 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 pots of, of funds. Um, in our case, they give us funds, and then they give you, the city council, the discretion of using it for our own programs or for community programs. Uh, it's entirely up to you. Uh, like for example, I can tell you with respect to the half a million dollar allocation, uh, some of what staff would like to reserve some of that amount for is for homelessness response, uh, COVID related, because we anticipate having some mm -hmm. impacts around that. Uh, in addition to obviously the community programs, uh, but but yes, to answer your question, there there is some of that available as well. So if this was like, you know, if they did lose these these amounts, they they could p potentially get it elsewhere too, or no? For some of them, I I don't know I mean, the situation for every single organization, but uh, potentially for some of them, yes, that that, that it would be available. Feel free to invite really me to any of your your meeting uh, nonprofits. So I can learn more. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but again, I can't speak for every single organization in the exact amount, but uh, it's certainly available just from my own personal experience. If I can add to, um, just because like, I think in the spirit of what Councilmember Brown is trying to accomplish is that, you know, I think it's really important that we recognize that during COVID, I mean, yes, a lot of, you know, businesses and institutions have been hit, but a lot of the small nonprofits that perform a lot of really core and critical function for you know, low-income families and people in our communities, you know, they're not getting the same donations as they normally would be getting. Um, they're, they're, getting they're receiving cuts. I mean, like, that's one of the things that was brought up is that the county is cut by 10 percent. If we didn't cut by 8 percent, you know, I think a lot of what these organizations are doing is trying to keep themselves whole. And with CARES funding coming in, they're trying to use it whatever they can to kind of backfill their losses, and I think one of the things we're trying to prevent is, you know, further loss, and given that this is $87,000 out of, you know, millions of dollars, it's not that big of a cut, or, uh, you know, it's not that big of an impact to our budget, I should say, and so I think that um, my understanding of what Council Member Brown's intention is, is to really try to continue to help support these nonprofits when they're facing a lot of um, um, cuts to their funding. Councilmember Matthews. To Councilmember Golder's question, nonprofits get funding from all kinds of sources. I'd be happy to, any of us could probably give you a little, our own personal background with that. What we're talking about right now is the level of funding support they get from the city of Santa Cruz. They all get 
money from a whole lot of other places, um, a varying amount. Um, and so, again, my understanding is that we will keep the funding at the um, original level without the cut with the expectation that when the CARES funding arrives, we will backfill to the maximum extent possible to reduce the amount of drain on the general fund. And that's where it ends. And then any other decisions about the, the CARES fund will be made at a separate time. Because I agree, there's a whole lot of things that could be spent on. I also just want to point out the Community Foundation did an absolutely spectacular um, fundraising and community drive specifically for CARES relief funding, and they have dispersed it to uh, community nonprofits. That's been the whole idea, is to, uh, for them to be a focal point for community donations and disperse it quickly to nonprofits who are doing important COVID-relating work. So there are other ways to, for the community to support. This is just about the city funding. Okay, Council Member Brown, Vice Mayor Myers, and then uh, just in the interest of time, um, hopefully we can move on because we have Parks and Rec and police, and I think there's going to be a lot of discussion, in, um, especially the police item. So, uh, Council Member Brown and then Vice Mayor Myers. Yeah, well, I'd, I would just add I also uh, was going to uh, say that I invite uh, Council Member Golder to have a conversation about this, uh, you know, and if you want to um, look at the community programs, the breakdowns, I have that document. So, um, and so, but Council Member Matthews kind of covered that. Um, and just the, the only other thing about, you know, this blank statement that, well, yes, you know, their organizations are getting funding from the state and the federal government to, um, you know, to, to help with their budgets. Yes, that is the case. Um, however, um, it, in many of those cases and all of the cases that I am aware of in our community, um, those funds are for very specific CARES related functions that may be new functions that these organizations are um, ramping up to try to, to, to do to serve the community. Um, and so it's not like they can just find the, you know, thousand dollars or whatever, you know, the federal government's just going to, you know, backfill in that way. So it's really, um, you know, it's, this is a way for, you know, unrestricted funding for nonprofits that is really critical for them to keep um, their, to stay whole, as something suggests. So, so, you know, try to help clarify a little, but if you want more detail, I'm happy to talk anytime. Vice Mayor Myers. Um, yeah, I uh, appreciate the comments, um, and I think I think the whole council shares, you know, uh, shares the commitment to to these organizations. A lot of people don't know if it's a nonprofit or something else that's providing them these all, all these services. Um, but I think um, I think we all have a long history of supporting and, and acknowledging the, the safety gap that um, a lot of these organizations um, serve um, in our community. Uh, I, I won't ask for an amendment to the motion, but I, I do hope that as the staff reviews things that I think there are there is a level of essential services that I think we want to achieve um, as we continue to make our way through the COVID issue. Um, and so I'm hoping as we sort through how this is going to get administered, that some of those um, types of considerations, and I'm thinking about um, making sure food can get to families. I'm thinking about, um, you know, rental assistance. I'm thinking about, um, uh, you know, if there's legal assistance kind of things, you know, these kinds of things that are keeping people stable in their homes, making sure families have food. Um, child care, I think, is very important um, so people can get to work if they need to go back to work. Um, so hopefully we can devise a system um, that, you know, again, doesn't necessarily choose one or the other, but kind of keeps an eye on the kinds of things that are most helpful for people at this point in time. Um, and I'm just going to say publicly, because we're on TV, um, the Santa Cruz Community Foundation uh, for any um, nonprofit organizations. I serve on boards of, of many, uh, I've served on boards and, and, and run nonprofit organizations. Community Foundation of Santa Cruz um, has both a COVID-19 relief fund 
and a um, wildfire impact fund. So again, uh, if nonprofits are in need of, of, of assistance, that's another place to, to look in the near term um, uh, to, to the point that many nonprofits gather funds from a lot of different places. So um, please take a look at their website as well. Take advantage of our, our little TV time here. Um, I'm supportive of the motion as well, um, but I do just want to publicly make those notes around uh, sort of looking at some of these essential things that I think deserve to maybe be a little bit more um, robust in our giving. So thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Watkins. I just wanted to echo those comments. I think that's sort of essentially what I was trying to say earlier is that there are certain things that have come up and that how government can be nimble to really ensure that some of these basic services and needs are really met for our community. And so how we move forward, we can also go forward with that awareness. So I know you didn't want um, Vice Mayor to make it as a formal amendment, but I, I just want to recognize and echo those, um, those comments in that direction. Okay. Uh, seeing no further comments, <clears throat> I'm just going to see if this motion is correct. But the motion before us is to adopt the city manager's budget with the addition of $20,000 for the UCSC advocate and to um, include the funding for the community core programs in the amount of $87,975 dollars. Um, with the intent to uh, utilize CARES funding to backfill um, some of those expenses to the greatest extent possible when the funds are available. And that was a motion made by Councilmember Brown, seconded by Mayor Cummings. And if there's no further discussion on the item, I'll turn it over to the clerk for the roll call vote. Oh, Councilmember Matthews. Just technically, it's the city county task force on UCSD expansion. Yes, city county. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Twenty thousand for the UCSC task force. No. Sorry, yeah. city county city task, task force. Task force. Yeah. Bonnie, I'll go ahead and turn oh, it over to you. Yes, okay. Councilmember Byers? Catherine, you're oh. muted. Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That passes unanimously. Okay, so we'll move on to the next uh, department, which is Parks and Rec. So I'll turn that over to Councilmember Golder. I just wanted to see if we could find a way to eliminate the cut to the Lighthouse Museum or um, reduce it so that it can remain open for at least part of the week. And I don't know if anyone has suggestions. I see some uh, hands. I see some hands. Sorry. I was looking, <laughs> at, I was looking at the budget. <laughs> Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Brown, then Vice Mayor Myers, and then Councilmember Matthews. Well, I, I um, thank you, Councilmember Golder. Um, this is one that is, is really hard for me, too. I, I'm wondering if we could perhaps, given the conversation we had earlier, um, direct staff to return mm -hmm. with um, uh, you know a plan for you know some options for keeping the the museum open uh, that we could then consider and make that decision with a, a little more understanding of where we might get some additional funds and or volunteer involvement. Just one possibility. Okay. Uh, Vice Mayor Myers. Oh, you're I, mean, muted. I would, um, yeah, I think direction to staff um, is appropriate uh, 
and that might be a um, I don't know if we need to make that into a motion or I'm, I'm, I'm sure that Tony is is probably um, happy to happy to try to make this happen um, uh, I've already reached out to some of the surfing groups sounds like a lot of people are already or starting to get organized around this so um, I think if we can just have the commitment from um, director Elliot to uh, potentially work with some community uh, groups that hopefully maybe we can figure out a way to either have a reduced schedule or, or figure out how to fill the gap. So um, they're uh, just in some brief text this evening. Um, since I brought this up, um, it looks like there's some some real energy around trying to trying to resolve this uh, deficit. So um, I but if, if we need a motion to direct the, the director Elliot to do that, I'm happy to make that motion after after further discussion. Okay. Council Member Matthews. Um, I support this general direction. Uh, we have to either, we have to adopt the budget. So it's either gonna have the cut or not a cut or something in between. So maybe Tony, do you wanna suggest, but um, I, I get the impression we all think there's um, very great potential for additional fundraising and volunteer support for this. So um, a kind of a um, <laughs> oxygen life support, modest amount, and Tony's nodding his head, Donna's nodding her head. So I think that that's what I would support. Just a lifeline while we reorg here. Tony, I just wanted to check real quick too. What's the current, or I guess typically during the winter, how often, or you know, that timeline, what are the hours of the Surf Museum? Is that, like, are they open during the week or is it just a weekend? I'm gonna see if Rachel Kaufman is out there on the hours. You're gonna stump me on the hours question. I was ready on the budget question. As uh, If Rachel can log on, as Rachel's uh, logging on here, Rachel's our recreation superintendent. Um, just quickly from a budget standpoint, um, the, the annual budget for temp staff is approximately 27,000. Since we're already a few months into the fiscal year, um, that value, uh, essentially the, the cost uh, avoidance, uh, having not been open at the Surfing Museum is approximately $8,000. So um, you know, just as, a, as an option and a frame of reference, it'd be 27,000 minus the 8,000. Um, I think specifically, let me see here, I think it's actually $8,400. Uh, so anyway, if you're looking for an exact number um, as an option, that would be that. But I'll send it over to Rachel for the hours here. Hi, uh, Mayor, City Council members. Yes, the hours vary um, throughout the year, so they open a longer amount of time during the summer, but they do reduce in the winter months. I think they're closed on Wednesday, for example, and then they have shorter hours during the week. Um, the Surfing Museum is allowed to operate as Santa Cruz County is in the red um, zone. And so when we're in purple, indoor museums are not allowed to operate. So it has remained closed just because it's been unable to open. We are able to open under red. And so we were looking even just at a reduced schedule on the weekends in red, just trying to accommodate um, the tourist traffic that comes in on the weekends. And even in red, we are only allowed to open at 25% capacity, and the museum is very small. So we were focused on you know, our funds on the weekends when we could um, accommodate maybe one person or a family at a time in the museum. So it, it will be a modified opening even when we open, just due to the COVID restrictions. Yeah, I was... Just curious about that because having been in there, it's pretty tiny and like, yeah, how, how do you operate that small of a, a space under COVID, yeah, safely, so. Yes, we've been evaluating that. I have a follow-up question to that. So, I mean, is there the potential for savings? As, well, not the potential for savings, but, you know, if we allocated these funds, for example, to this and we see that you know there's an increase in COVID, and um, the museum ends up being closed or lo closed longer. Would we anticipate then spending those funds, or would those ultimately not get spent and then 
you know, we have it as a savings as well. I mean, obviously, it's you know, it's it's dynamic and fluid because we just don't know what's going to happen. But I don't know if you can speak to that at all. Yeah, if we couldn't open, those funds would not be uh, would not be spent. Okay. Um, I, I have. Yeah. Sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the idea here is to. I had my hand up too. <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> you go. You go. Or Justin's the mayor. <laughs> Donna, yeah. Yeah. Donna, why don't you go first and then Cynthia? Um, it sounds like we're starting to get towards a motion or some kind of, um, so I'm, I'm thinking why don't I maybe put a motion out to see if we can get closure on it. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we retain um, $10,000 in the line item for the museum uh, under the Parks and Recreation budget to maintain limited hours for the surf museum as allowed under under COVID rules and um, to direct um, park staff to work with community nonprofit partners for additional funds as needed to maintain um, the museum in a, in a uh, reduced hourly, reduced hour, uh, uh, situation for the rest of the through the end of June through the end of June 2021. Yeah. I'll, I'll second it but I think we could also say to um, uh, work with additional volunteer and fundraising to operate the museum to the greatest extent possible I mean really, <laughs> why restrict ourselves <laughs> yeah uh, that's that's a good amendment I'll take that amendment thank you Uh, Council Member Matthews. That was it. That's it? Okay. Council Member Golder. Yeah, I'm not trying to add more layers of red tape, but is there a way to add in, like, maybe increasing any retail or re retail opportunities or opportunities to make money at the lighthouse? And um, I took a really interesting class, History of Museums, when I was up at the university, and I know those kids always have to do, or young adults always need to do community service. I wonder if reaching out to them to come down and do hours uh, volunteering in the museum. I don't know how to facilitate that, though. So. I think if we, um, if we can put in the motion, direct staff to explore partnerships with community nonprofits and partners on fundraising to um, raise funds to keep the museum open to the greatest extent possible and um, review additional business um, uh, opportunities, including um, uh, the, retail, uh, the retail structure and use of volunteers um, for maintaining open hours. How's that sound? Does that work? Okay. I'm done. The little museum that could. <laughs> Are you okay with that amendment, Council Member? Yeah, I, I, I think all of that is inclusive of the amendment, which was just to reach out and involve the community yep. and all of the above. I don't think we want to be too specific with what we expect everyone to be doing. Just go out and be creative. I do have a clarification though on the wording. I want to get Mayor's attention. Okay? Yep, go ahead. Okay. Uh, saying uh, investigate other retail, I mean, that's really broad. I'm hoping that that doesn't send parts looking at opening coffee shop. I don't know what you meant by that, but well, I guess um, Councilman Golder brought it up. I assume we're talking about retail within the museum. Yeah, yeah, that's all okay. I was meaning, like selling some more postcards or no, a T-shirt or something okay. to raise a couple bucks. I'm done with my comment. Yeah. Okay. Council Member yeah. Matthews. Yeah, I actually have some familiarity with the running of the museum way back in time. Mm -hmm. They do their damnedest best. They got about four square feet there. And they know what's and what doesn't sell, and I agree. They try to milk the best they can out of it. 
So that's why I just favor keeping it simple. Yeah. Good for the motion. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to see if I capture <clears throat> this motion. <laughs> So uh, we had a motion by Vice Mayor Myers, seconded by, by Council Member Matthews, to adopt the Parks and Rec budget, um, with the exception of item number 53, the Surf Museum, to retain $10,000 in the Parks budget for the Surf Museum to maintain limited hours of access, and then direct the staff to work with community partners um, for fundraising um, to keep the museum open to the greatest extent possible and further retail opportunities and opportunities for volunteers to maintain hours. I think that's, that captures it. If, yeah, you know, yeah, the intent is is not coffee shop, the retail opportunity right. maybe. Yeah, we cleared that. A COVID-19 sweatshirt saved the surf museum, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay, if that all sounds good, I'll turn it over to the clerk to call the roll call vote. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Byers? Aye. Matthews? Aye. Brown? Aye. Golder? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings? Aye. That item passes unanimously. Okay, last item uh, on the agenda is the police budget. And so why don't we start with the uh, victim's advocate position and then if there's discussion around, um, well, we can start with the police budget. I know there was mention of wanting to discuss the victim's advocate position, uh, but then when we start going to conversations or if there's conversations regarding the, um, um, sorry, the, the Rangers, then we will have to have that discussion separately with um, Council Member Matthews recusing herself. So um, why don't we go with uh, Council Member Watkins? Yeah, no problem. I'm I'm planning to make a motion to retain the victim's advocate position. I um, clearly will keep out the conversation around the Rangers until Councilmember Matthews recuses herself. Um, and I'm willing to uh, accept all of the other aspects within the budget aside from the Rangers. Um, I did want to get, if I could, from our police chief a little further clarification, and I apologize, I didn't answer this, ask you this earlier, in regards to the gang intervention and prevention funding, the PRIDE program and the youth academies, what, what types of programs um, are those and, and what's the potential impact from these cuts? Uh, those cuts are uh, programs that we work with the County Office of Education and the DA's office and others to collaborate on things like buying cleats for kids and and helping with uh, a variety of other things to keep kids busy and um, uh, during the summertime, for instance, <clears throat> as well as some mentoring uh, that has taken place. Uh, those are fairly small amounts, uh, 20 to $30,000, if I recall correctly. Um, it's off the top of my head. I'd have to actually go and look at the line items, <clears throat> but uh, that's what those are primarily for. And the partners are aware of that, those cuts coming? Yes, Okay, well, I'll go ahead and proceed then with the motion at this time, absent the park rangers and to retain the, the victim's advocate. Okay. I'm just wondering in terms of process because um, the, it's complicated because of the fact that the, the if we cut the, or if we do the, the shifts, or I'm sorry, um, Part of the Rangers, you know, discussion involves the CSOs, which also involves the victim's advocate. So I'm wondering, within your motion, is the intention to move forward with those CSO positions, keep the victim's advocate, and then have a discussion on what happens with the Rangers? Or I'm just trying to get some clarity on, you know, how we deal with this issue of, you know, by retaining the victim. Because my understanding is that one of those CSOs, if we were to change the victim's advocate position, 
that person might um, become a CSO. Um, but if we don't put the victim's advocate, if we keep the victim's advocate, then what does that mean in terms of the number of CSO positions that are created? So I'm wondering if I can get some clarity around that, Chief Councilmember Watkins or Chief sure. no. I think, I mean, I can, I can sort of tell you my intention, and I, I realize that there's sort of a domino impact here, but I think essentially that the hope is that we um, maintain the victim's advocate position, recognizing how valuable it is, particularly in this time, in regards to supporting our victims, but we've seen sort of heightened numbers of domestic violence and clearly the mental health aspects, and obviously she's a, a, a Aside from the individual, but obviously that that position is really critical right now. So maintaining that position, and then in regards to sort of what the CSO Park Ranger conversation, I think that could uh, do after we make them, we continue to vote on whether or not to maintain the victim's advocate. So I would separate the two. And I welcome the chief's input if if you have further thoughts on that. I completely understand. Excuse me, what you're what you're saying, Council Member, and uh, I think the difference. I think what the mayor is driving at is, if the position was cut, it could wind up being a CSO position. Yeah. Uh, but that would reduce the amount of CSO positions available at the ranger level, also, uh, that for those that could go over, reapply, and go over to that position. So if, if it's retained wholly on its own, that's just a completely different issue. And just to clarify too, and the intent would be if the victim advocate was a CSO that they would retain their victim advocacy functions, except it would be in the CSO classification as opposed to the victim advocate classification. So it, they would just be in a different classification, but would continue to, to provide the same service, just to be clear. And it would not result in a pay reduction uh, or impact to the individual insofar as their uh, 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 pay and compensation is mentioned. I wonder for the purposes of process to move this forward, if there could be an intention to retain the victim's advocate position, and we could further discuss whether we wanted a reclassification of that position as we discuss CSOs and park rangers later. Uh, if that's a question, yes, our intention would be to uh, try to retain the uh, victim advocate. Yeah, so, so perhaps maybe you should discuss the Rangers and then depending on, on how that goes, then you can uh, clarify the, the victim advocate. I think, that, I think the question is, the issue is that if you, uh, if the council does proceed with, with the, uh, the reorganization of uh, the rangers and CSOs, um, then that provides a space or an option for the victim advocate to move. If that's not the case, though, if the council does not proceed with the organization, then there isn't a place for the victim advocate to, to move, and so therefore it has that impact, so the council may not want to proceed under that scenario as well. So for the purposes of process then, if I'm hearing you correctly, that ideally we wouldn't take action on the police budget and we would have Councilmember Matthews recuse herself at this moment, I would motion and then we'll go ahead and, and go ahead and begin the discussions around the park rangers. But I'll just state my intention, which is to keep the victim's advocate position at this time in one form or yeah. Okay, so we'll go ahead and let's go ahead and withdraw the motion and then proceed with the conversation around the park rangers. Okay. Sounds good. Um, is there any, are there any, Councilmember Matthews? Oh, I was going to bow out. Okay. <laughs> and then uh, Councilmember Byers, I see your hands raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, um, yeah, I, think, I think we've settled down that it's really all about the CSOs because if, uh, I was comfortable from our discussion earlier today with uh, Chief Mills, what what it means and what those people will be doing and one will be a CSO. A CSO will have that working title, I guess you call it, but her class, their, he, she, classification would be a CSO. Uh, I, it all works out. I don't know that there's an issue other than agreeing on the 
moving towards CSOs instead of park rangers. Maybe some of those park rangers will become CSOs as well. So uh, I think that's all the tent uh, and talking a couple months ago with Chief Mill, so it's been a while. But I think we've pretty well resolved it, if everyone agrees that having CSOs, I think I said earlier, I like the title, but uh, there's so much more flexibility and you can look for specific um, criteria that we're looking for at that moment. So anyway, I'm just ready to move forward with uh, the budget as outlined, knowing that the, that will happen. The advocate yeah. vote. So, and Chief, correct me if I'm wrong, but it, what it sounds like is that, um, you know, with the reorganization that six, maybe six um, community service officer positions will be created, one of which role would be to re retain this victim advocate role. Is that a correct assumption to make? That is correct. Okay. Councilmember Byers, did you have an additional question? I don't no, know. No, that was it. Yeah, was it. thank you. Okay. Councilmember Watkins. I just had a quick question. So does, in terms of process, does that mean that person would have to apply and go through the application process to be, or would they have a reclassification? I'm not 100% sure uh, with the with the rules. <clears throat> the intent was to have everybody reapply, uh, but uh, we can certainly, uh, you know, we think very highly of our uh, victim advocate who's been here for 28 years and has done a marvelous job. And uh, I can't say enough good about uh, what uh, that person has done. Uh, I would just have to check with HR to make sure that it's fair all the way across the board and uh, that, we're, that we're consistent with the rules. Um, whatever that may be. Uh, just want to point out that Lisa, Lisa's on and, and can explain that further, but it would be in an internal process only. But go ahead, uh, Lisa. Yeah, we, we have multiple processes that we can use. The first one that we would uh, use is our internal um, recruitment process. Obviously, we have more bodies than we have positions. And so the intention would be to uh, develop an internal recruitment list for those that are qualified for those positions and then interview from that. Um, and then if they exist, the list is exhausted and they aren't selected, if somebody isn't selected, we also have a current list of CSO applicants that we would then um, look to that list. The one other you know, piece would be is that for the victim advocate duties from CSO part of their duties, we would have to go to the POA, which I um, anticipate wouldn't be difficult, but we do have to negotiate that the um, those duties would move over to um, the CSO because it's within the same bargaining unit. So I do want to make it clear that the intention is to go through an application process of an internal um, recruitment first, then to the external list that we have existing. Thank you for the clarification. Is there any further discussion by council members on this item? Councilmember Golden. So I have to say this is one of the most difficult decisions I think that's come before me in I don't even know how long. And like quite frankly, it woke me up at night with <laughs> nightmares and I've lost sleep over this issue. And I feel sick about it because I'm so passionate about public safety. And so I'm just really torn and then having you know, been in education so many years and been pink slipped so many times, I know that it's really hard on individuals and families when you do get laid off and you have to figure out, you know, what next kind of thing. And um, just whatever the outcome, know that I'm sure I'm not the only one that we're not taking this decision lightly and that it's only in the context of this unprecedented crisis that we are even discussing this right now. Okay, 
Are there any further um, questions or comments by council members at this time on this item? Okay, I think uh, what would be most appropriate, and again, council member Golder shares sentiments that this, you know, this budget process and everything we're going through is probably one of the hardest uh, decisions that council members have had to make in a extreme, in a very long time. But um, part of our role is to make difficult decisions, and before us is probably one of the most difficult ones we have. So um, with that, I think what would be uh, most appropriate is if we. Um, if we uh, have a motion related to uh, the parks, the police park services item and the creation of the um, community service officer items. And then once those are passed, we can invite council member Matthews back to vote on the remaining items um, in the police budget. And so uh, that would be currently focusing on items 33 and 34 listed in the police budget, and then inviting Councilmember Matthews back to vote on items numbers 35 through 41 in the police budget. And so with that, um, looking for someone to make a motion on the decision for the parks, park rangers and the creation of the um, community service officers with one of those positions uh, being the role of a uh, victim's advocate. Councilmember Byers. Well, I, I don't have any paper or pencil in front of me, so I can't form the motion that I would be articulate enough. But I think um, if Bonnie has written down what uh, city clerk has written down what you said, I will move that motion just as you outlined but I need her to read it because I did not write anything down. Maybe somebody else has, written, has it ready to go. But. Could you ask the clerk to Bonnie. do that? Sure. Yeah, Bonnie, did you, were you able to capture the language? From you, yes. Um, yeah. I didn't catch who made the motion but, or seconded. I don't think we got there yet, but Park, um, to approve the police budget regarding park rangers and creation of CSO positions with one of those being the role of the victim advocate. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, I will so move that motion. Okay. I will so move. We got a motion by council member Byers. There's a second to the motion. Okay. I'll go ahead and second the motion. It's on the floor. To a motion by Council Member Byers, seconded by the mayor to approve the police budget uh, regarding the um, park rangers, the elimination of the park rangers in lieu of another service model and uh, the establishment of the community service officer's position uh, six positions, one of which would be um, a, a victim's advocate. That's the current motion on the floor that's been made by Council Member Byers, second by the mayor. Is there any further discussion? Okay. Hearing none, I'll turn it over to the... Uh, Sorry, I wanted to add something. Sure, it, go ahead. It seems to me that we're still looking at retaining the park rangers and that title and several of them. I want to go back to the earlier, early this evening actually, trying to uh, answer the difference between a park ranger and a CSO. As I understand, CSOs would have that flexibility uh, to do whatever the department needs them to do. And if that is to have two of them in Poganip or in our open spaces, I, I, something I, I'm missing, maybe someone who's not going to support this motion could help me on that. But I thought that it all made, it made sense to me, let me put it that way, that we will have those bodies, they will be able to go into the Poganip, go lead tours when things get normal, 
and have that ability to do a lot more, uh, more, I don't know, I don't want to say social services or um, sort of another level of which will be part of the community rather than a park ranger. So I think, I think it's just expanding the duties uh, and being able to hire those appropriate and hopefully many will get to stay, they won't lose their job. So anyway, that's all. I think that, I think we really talked about this earlier tonight. Thank you, Councilmember Byers. And that was the interpretation that I had gotten to. And I think that, you know, if there are, if there's another direction the council members would like to go in, you know, more than happy to hear, but, um, you know, in the sake of needing to move on with this item and the rest of the police budget, um, I know that, you know, as we mentioned before, difficult decisions have to be made. And so um, with that, um, unless there's any further comment, um, you know, I think we can move on with the roll call vote on this item. Um, but I do want to say that, you know, I very much respect all the people in these positions. And I also want to bring up, because I know that there was discussion around, you know, exploring other roles for ranger positions in the future in parks and in other departments. And so I wanted to bring that back too, because I didn't want that to be forgotten in this conversation as well. Um, Vice Mayor Myers and then Council Member Golder. Sorry, uh, Mayor, could you, could, could you read the motion one more time, please? I'll just, I can share my screen if you want. Great, thank you. Mm This is Lisa. I uh, I see that it says nine, but the positions that are actually up for elimination are 12. That's, oh, okay. I was going by the resolution. Council Member Golder. Is, I don't know if this could be a friendly amendment or if there's another way to discuss this, but basically um, I'm wondering just knowing that it's I know it's about the, posi the uh, positions, not the people, but the person in the vi victim advocate position has been with the city for a number of years. And at, if I heard correctly, 28 must be close to retirement. And so I would, I mean, just if that, I'm not sure I, if, if it would be possible, but to keep that position classified as it is and not have it be one of the six community service officers in this motion and then um, moving forward, collaborating with the district attorney's office in the next few years about how they could possibly take over that role as victim's advocate. But when one of the callers called in and brought, um, brought up a point that was that not every victim has, I don't know how they said it, but basically has closure of going to court kind of a thing. And so there were, could take years that I, I don't know, I just would like to see some sort of transition period and seeing as that person is probably close to retirement age, maybe a, several years of a transition while keeping that position intact could be considered. Um, if I could speak to that, I'm a tiny bit confused. Um, so my understanding is that the, DA, the DA's office has, and um, maybe if, uh, Chief Mills is on, but my understanding is that the DA's office has four victims advocates currently. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't know that the number is four, Mayor, but uh, they have several uh, victim okay. advocates. And I think that what, kind of getting to your point, Council Member Gold, is the, the, what the person who called in brought up and what I've heard from members of the public is not everything goes to trial, so if it doesn't go to trial, then that's where we benefit by having our own city victims advocate. Um, and I think that if, 
I think the issue is that if we keep that position, then there's no savings from that position. But if we shift that position to a CSO position, that there is some level of savings by having a victim's advocate classified as a CSO. Um, and I'll look to maybe the chief as well on this one, if, if that's the correct interpretation of what's being recommended or suggested here. Yeah, so the, by the victim advocate taking one of the CSO positions, that eliminates just one more position from the department uh, to come up with the total that we needed. So that would eliminate, that would reduce the number of positions available uh, to, to make CSOs from uh, the Ranger Corps by one. Uh, Councilmember Watkins. Um, I just I want to say I follow Councilmember Golder's logic on this a little bit, and that this person has been there for 28 years in this classification. So it, to a certain extent, just logically, it makes sense to kind of maintain that until a natural shift would occur. Um, so so then if the then the, if the re, so if that individual was going to take up one of the six CSOs, then the the potential outcome would be then to make it so that there'd be five CSOs and a victim's advocate. That would make the cost neutral. Is that correct? Maybe that's a question for Martine or Andy. Uh, yeah, I was just uh, uh, talking to Andy about that, and, and that's what I understood. Renee trying to uh, oh, Councilmember Golder trying to to say here. Um, so I was. Uh, uh, I'll uh, turn it over to Andy. I mean, I think from a cost perspective, I think it's, it would be relatively the same, uh, I believe. Um, um, so I think it'd be relatively cost neutral, but uh, it would be more the operational impact of any. Yes, that is that is correct, uh, Manager, that, uh, that it would be fairly close in cost. Yeah, so that would achieve the essentially the same level of savings sentence, instead of keeping the victim advocate and having five CSOs instead of six CSOs. Do we need amendment to do that in my motion? Yes. yes. No. Sure. If you, I mean, I think yeah. If you'd like to. Does someone want to make amendment to the main motion? Or should I just change it? We do have a second. I need it in front of me again. Or is it just understood? Let me, uh, why don't I recognize Councilmember Golden and then if we need to, okay. we can circle back and then okay. if we, we need to make it. I got it. Do it. Yeah. yeah, sounds good. It was basically that, yes, what everyone yeah. just said is capturing what I was expressing. Yeah. Very and I don't good. know how. I, if yeah. somebody could, re good. if you could restate that for the motion or for the minute, please. Me? Yeah. Yes. So I'm advocating that we keep the victim's advocate position until a natural transition, maybe um, when Ms. Snyder re retires and um, then look for other options. So if that means having to change the CSO positions to five, then that's what I'm suggesting. So if I can restate that, then the amendment would be to keep the police investigator's victim advocate position as is until the current person, um, until the role is, is vacant, at which time it can be shifted to a, a CSO role and then reduce the number of community service officer positions from six to five. Is there any further discussion on this item? Any further comments from council members? Okay. Council member Golden. I just still feel like how can we be sure? And I know nothing's like sure in life, but how can we be sure? that if we make this shift, that these CSOs will be out walking the parks. Because I have to say, I spent a lot of time up in Poganip, you know, cruising around, and I 
always see the Rangers, and I've, you know, I, I want to make sure it's still going to be safe up there for people that are hiking or biking or whatever, bird watching, whatever. Um, Chief Mills, do you want to maybe comment on that? Uh, do, would it would we need to provide any kind of language or, um, you know, within our motion that part of the role of the CSOs will be, be to patrol parks and open space? Yeah, you're certainly welcome to do that, obviously, uh, to put in the motion that uh, part of their duties would be in the parks. Um, and we would certainly agree to that. Uh, I think one of the things, you, again, you have to understand is that hopefully uh, all of the, not all the rangers, but the rangers who are interested are welcome to apply for the CSO position and then wind up working in the same parks in the same areas that they are currently working. Um, you know, we are losing a couple of positions and that will have an impact. Uh, but at the same time, uh, these are the same folks doing the same duties right now uh, with just enhanced responsibility and capability as well. Councilmember Golder. Hey, me again. So is it possible to also add, I know we talked a little bit when um, Councilmember Brown brought up as funding starts to come back, to bring back people not in um, public safety, but more in the interpretive roles. I can speak to the water department and the sanitation department that lead like excellent field trips. And so I would love to see that in the open spaces and the beaches. Would it be possible to provide some direction that, you know, moving forward as funding starts to come back that would be something we would have again. Martin, do you want to take that question? Yeah, I can comment on that. Uh, I mean, absolutely, of course. I mean, the, the council uh, can, can certainly uh, ask that we look at that and uh, we can move forward to, towards that. And I think there's any number of ways that that could uh, develop, um, you know, uh, the best case scenario, quite frankly, would be if, if there's some change in November at the federal level and we receive stimulus funding of the, of the level that uh, um, has uh, already been uh, adopted by the, uh, uh, the Congress, uh, at least the, uh, the House of Representatives, uh, that would probably allow us to restore uh, these cuts at that level uh, and maybe enhance in, in some ways. Uh, 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 although that's one-time funding, it would you know, at least allow us to, to restart a minimum um, and enhance sort of one-time sorts of things to respond to the pandemic. Uh, that would be great, um, um, but we won't know uh, about that, and there's no certainty on that. Uh, the other two is that I think the, the community will have an opportunity to have a conversation with the community, uh, particularly as it relates to parks, about the level of support, uh, a level of effort, because um, we do have a need, even before the, the COVID pandemic, you know, there was a great need for particularly infrastructure funding uh, in our parks facilities. Um, and even then we were, we were uh, still struggling to meet the, the maintenance need of the parks uh, as well as the, 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 the range of functions. Uh, so I think uh, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to have conversations with the community about whether they're willing to support those things uh, potentially uh, with respect to perhaps looking at a ballot measure, for example. Um, and as you saw in our projections, you know, we will get to a point to where we can restore things, although it's a few years away, but if we wanted to be quicker than that, I think having conversation with the community, there certainly are potentials to do that. We were looking at some of those options before the pandemic that look promising, and I think we can look at options for a variety of things. Councilmember Goldie, to your point, I'm wondering if um, part of the amendment could be to that um, one is that part of the duties of the community service officers would be um, patrolling parks and open spaces. And in the beach, in the beaches, and levees, like yeah, is that open spaces, that too. Open yeah. spaces, yeah, yeah, just keeping it general. So yeah, parks and open spaces, and then um, 
moving forward as funding becomes available to explore the creation of park rangers whose role would be in conservation and ecological interpretation. Okay. Bonnie, did you catch that? I did. Can you um, put the motion on the screen? Because I did want to bring one point up to council. Um, one thing I was going to mention is within the motion, maybe um, what we could do, given that Council Member Matthews um, would need to return for some of the rest of the items, is that um, we make an amendment to the motion where um, adopt the portion of the police department's budget related to the elimination of 12 ranger positions and the creation of five community officers and then the other amendments without the um, victim advocate position. Yeah. So the idea would be that um, change that to five, and then just eliminate the the language around the victim advocate, and then um, eliminate this, the front the first friendly amendment. Because I think what we can do is when we when Councilmember Matthews comes back, when we vote on the rest of the the item that's before us, we can just have a motion that would in, that would keep the police investigator victim's advocacy position and include that language. Does that sound appropriate to other council members? Okay. Was this friendly amendment accepted? Yes. Councilmember Byers, did you accept that amendment as well? Yes. <laughs> yes, I do. Okay. Um, if there's no further questions, um, we can go ahead and take the roll call vote on the item. Okay. Councilmember Byers? Aye. Brown? No. Um, Golder? <laughs> Sorry, guys, I'm still not ready. To... <laughs> this is really difficult. Aye. Um, Watkins? Aye. Vice Mayor Myers? Aye. And Mayor Cummings. Aye. So motion passes with um, Councilmember Byers, Golder, Watkins, Vice Mayor Myers, and myself voting in favor. Councilmember Brown voting opposed. And so at this time, I'd like to ask uh, Councilmember Matthews to rejoin the meeting so that we can vote on the remaining items in the police budget. Mayor, can. Yes. If I may just make one more comment, though, I just had one more thought with respect to uh, Councilmember Golder's uh, question. The other thing, too, I think uh, just to keep in mind is that, uh, again, hopefully there will be some relief at the federal level, but the other thing that you're going to have to think about that if we don't and we have to make those additional cuts next year, that that's an additional $4 million. So, and, and again, in thinking about the community and level of service, uh, in, in this round, we've cut a lot of the vacant positions. We've cut a lot of the, the uh, supplies and services part of the budget. So, uh, unfortunately, that is even going to be that's going to be as, as or if not more difficult than what you're facing now. If we have to do that level of cuts, because it's it's. So I think the conversation with the community will be even more critical because we're going to be seeing even further. Uh, degradation of services and uh, so I just wanted to point that aspect of it as we look ahead that it's not just uh, uh, making up for what you cut now but we're having to come up with additional uh, levels that are you know comparable to what we've done done now and it'll be a challenge as well so I'll have to think about that in terms of the community conversations thank you okay so um Remaining in the police budget are items numbers 35 through 41, uh, one of which is item number 39 is a cut to the police and um, 
victim's advocate, and so based on our conversation, um, it seems like the appropriate thing to, move, to do moving forward would be to um, adopt the remaining um, recommendations for the police budget with the exception of the police victim's advocate position, um, which would be retained and um, upon um, that position becoming vacant would then be moved to a community service officer position. If that's my, under if my understanding is correct, I think that's where we landed on. Okay, Council Member Matthews. Um, I think a clean motion is better, not anticipating what's gonna happen in the future. I mean, city managers talk to us. We're just at the beginning of this budget nightmare. So I would just leave it clean. That would be my suggestion. Okay. Does that language sound clean? Well, I wouldn't even anticipate, you know, until yeah. that person retires and then it's for the yeah. CSO. I agree. Okay. Just, just retain that position, period. Okay. All right. So yeah, not, not not cut the position basically. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we'll need a motion to pass the remaining recommendations with the exception of the victim's advocate, which would be retained. Um I'll be back. Thank you.